in association with Mindray, it gives me an immense pleasure to welcome you all for our third online webinar session, Female Genital System Pathology. For any pathology department, female genital system form the major bulk of the cases we deal in our routine work. And having a good knowledge of the system help us in building a good pathology practice. We are excited to have national and international renowned pathologists to talk in this saga. This will be a prologue for our upcoming 89th IAPM chapter meeting, scheduled on Sunday, 28th, August 2022, where FGS is the slide seminar topic. It is my honor and privilege to welcome our distinguished speakers, Dr. Diana, Senior Consultant Pathology, National University Hospital, Singapore, Dr. Sandosh Menon, Professor of Pathology, TMH Mumbai, Dr. Bharat Regi, Professor of Pathology, TMH Mumbai, Dr. Mihir Gudi, Senior Consultant Pathology, KK Women's and Children's Hospital, Singapore, Dr. Radhika Srinivasan, Professor of Pathology, PGA Chandigarh, Dr. Kedar Diyodar, Professor of Pathology, TMH Mumbai, and Dr. Sandeep Mathur, Professor of Pathology, All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi, who will be with us for the next two days to share their vast knowledge and experience. I also like to take this opportunity to welcome our esteemed moderator for each session who have kindly agreed to share the sessions. And I like to welcome and thank Mindre team for providing us this platform to conduct this academic session. And last but not the least, the chapter invites all its members, consultant pathologists, and postgraduates post across the country to be a part of this webinar. Now I welcome Dr. Rajanji, President, IAPM Kerala chapter for the presidential address. Over to you, sir. Respected guest speakers, chapter members who, who is willing to, who has uh, given willingness to moderate the various sessions. My colleagues, pathologists across India, and my dear postgraduates. This is the third webinar we IAPN Kerala chapter is conducting. First was on lymphoma prior to our 87th chapter meeting, where our slide seminar topic was on lymph node pathology. The second webinar was on neuropathology prior to the 88th chapter meeting. Again, the slide seminar topic was on neuropathology. Indeed, it became a routine practice to conduct a webinar just before the chapter meeting, focusing on the slide seminar topic. This time, as you know, our 89th chapter meeting is on female genital tract pathology to be held on 28th August 2022. And remember that after four consecutive online state meet, we are conducting a, an offline meeting this time, a physical meeting this time, the venue is Baby Memorial Hospital, Calicut. And I request all the chapter members to come for the uh, state meet and make it a grand success. As our secretary said that we this time also we got some eminent faculty across country as well as international faculties are there who, who are actually uh, contribute to uh, uh, these areas. And this coming to this evening and the tomorrow evening, tomorrow evening there will be four sessions and this evening there will be three sessions. And there is a slight change in the program schedule today. Uh, 7.30 to 8.30, it was uh, already, it was Sandosh Menon who was uh, taking the mesenchymal tumors of uh, the uterus. And this is postponed to the third session. And the Sandosh Menon topic will, uh, lecture will start by 8.30 to 9.30 and 7.30 to 8.30, it is Bharat Rekhi who is actually presenting. So that is the program schedule. There is a slight change. Otherwise, there is no, no other major change in the program schedule. And uh, this is the third time we are collaborating with the Mindra India. And uh, it's actually the backbone for any webinar that is conducted by IAPN Kerala chapter. Thanks to Mahindra India for their extreme support, the technical support that is given for registration, everything. And I'm not standing in between you and the uh, speakers. So we can start this program and over to uh, Dr. Ani Praveen, Secretary. Thank you, sir. So without further delay, we'll start our first session of the day. And it is my pleasure to welcome my teacher, Dr. Ajit Nambia, to introduce the first speaker. 
Sir was a former head of the Department of Pathology at Amrita Institute of Medical Science and currently serves the Director and Head of Advanced Center for Pathology and Lab Medicine, Karkinos Health Center, Kochi. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Annie. And it's a really wonderful feeling to be back with the, the Kerala uh, State Chapter webinar program. Thank you, uh, Radhan sir, for conducting this and really a privilege uh, you know, to be part of it and also, you know, uh, giving that immense, uh, you know, kind of opportunity for postgraduate across. Uh, today, you know, uh, we have a, we have a, uh, we have the privilege to have Dr. Dina Lin. And it's indeed, uh, you know, endometrial carcinomas are common malignancy in our daily practice nowadays. You know, we have come a long way from, from our histological you know, morphology, grading, staging, and, and also, you know, what we do as typing of these tumors. Yes, we know about our problems of inter observer variability when it comes to high-grade endometrial carcinomas. But, you know, with, personali with personalization in, in, uh, in, in medicine and with advent of molecular pathology, it becomes very important that, you know, very, you know, any classification is, is meaningful. You know, from a prognostic and and you know from a therapeutic uh, relevance, and even our you know uh, uh, the cancer genome atlas, which has come way back a decade back, has really contributed a lot to the genomic basis in endometrial carcinoma. And who better to speak to us about this uh, than Dr. Dina? Dr. Dina is the senior consultant at the National University of Health System in Singapore. She's also the director of the Molecular Oncology Center which is a cap accredited lab focused on molecular diagnostics of solid tumors. Her special interest lies in gynae and molecular pathology. And she's done her FRC path and FRC PA. Uh, she, apart from that, she's undergone subspecialty training in gynae pathology at the Mass General and has followed up with a fellowship uh, at the Memorial. She's published several review articles, abstracts and book chapters related to gynae and molecular pathology. She's also a contributing author to the fifth edition of the W2 classification of human genetic class. And Dr. Dinah is going to speak to us uh, on the changes in the 2020 WHO classification and the carcinoma and also the molecular classification. Over to you, Dr. Dinah. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Nabia, for the kind invitation. Let me share my screen. Are you seeing my screen? No, madam. No. Okay, hang on. Yes, now it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Madam, make it full screen. Yeah, I'm, I'm switching it. Now? It's okay? Yes, yes. Okay. So thank you to the organizers for the kind invitation to speak at this meeting today. Um, my name is Diana Lim and I'm from uh, Singapore. So before I start my talk, I thought I'd give you a brief introduction of where I come from. And um, for those of you who are, may not be familiar, Singapore is a island nation with a population of slightly less than five and a half million people situated at the tip of the Malayan Peninsula. We have a mascot, which is a hybrid between a, malayan and a mermaid and a lion, both of which do not actually exist on the island. We have a garden, which looks like it belongs on the set of a sci-fi movie. And we perhaps have the unfortunate reputation of being one, the only country in the world who has banned the sale of chewing gum. So I currently practice at the National University Hospital, which is a tertiary ruffle hospital and an academic medical center. NUH is also the principal teaching hospital for the National University of Singapore School of Medicine. The hospital has a department of ONG with a division of gynae oncology comprising of three gynae oncology sur surgeons. Um, and endometrial cancers are the most commonly encountered gynae malignancy in my daily practice. So gynae cancers are also the most common gyne uh, gynecological malignancy in Western countries, and it is the fifth most common cancer in women worldwide. It is estimated that by the year 2035, about 500 
million, 500,000 new cases of endometrial cancers will be diagnosed yearly. While the global obesity epidemic, together with other risk factors such as an aging population, decrease in the use of hormone replacement therapy, decreasing hysterectomy rates for benign disease, uh, and uh, the increased prevalence of diabetes have all contributed to an increase in the incidence of endometrial cancer. Now, different classification systems of endometrial cancers have been adopted throughout the years. This includes the Bachmann classification, which divides endometrial cancers into type 1 and type 2 tumors, and the WHO classification, which classifies tumors according to the histopathological characteristics. Now, more recently, a molecular classification of these tumors have also been proposed. In the 1980s, Bachmann proposed that endometrial cancers can be separated into two groups based on their clinical, metabolic, and endocrine characteristics. The prototypical type 1 and type 2 cancers will be the endometroid and the serous carcinoma, respectively. Type 1 tumors are associated with a hyperestrogenic state and are often preceded by endometrial hyperplasia. These tumors tend to be well to moderately differentiated, show hormone receptor positivity, and have favorable clinical outcomes. In contrast, type 2 tumors are more common in non-obese women and they arise in the absence of metabolic or endocrine disturbances, usually in the background of atrophic um, endometrium. These tumors tend to be poorly differentiated and are often associated with a poor clinical outcome. The WHO classification, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, classifies endometrial carcinomas into the various subtypes listed here. So in my talk today, I will touch upon the use of a binary grading system in endometrial carcinomas, discuss the issue of synchronous endometrial and ovarian endometrial tumors, as well as the prognostic significance of extensive lymphovascular invasion. And during the second half of my talk, I will also be discussing the various molecular subtypes which have been discovered in the recent years and how we can make use of certain surrogate markers to stratify these tumors into the molecular subtypes in clinical practice. I will touch upon the use of um, some immunomarkers and how to interpret these immunomarkers in serous and clear cell carcinomas, discuss the current definition of what constitutes a mixed endometrial carcinoma, and also briefly talk about some of the less commonly encountered subtypes of endometrial cancers. So as you know, pathological grading is very important for the risk, stratifica risk stratification and management of endometrial carcinoma. These tumors are traditionally graded using the FIGO grading system and separated into grade one, two, and three tumors based on the amount of solid non-squamous or non morular proliferation that's present within the tumor. The presence of severe cytologic atypia in the majority of the tumor cells increases the grade by one level, but in my experience, this is not a common finding. And in instances where there is a distinct discrepancy between the architecture and the cytology, the possibility of a serous or even clear cell carcinoma should be excluded. Now, the International Society of Gynecologic Pathologists has recommended moving towards a binary grading system by considering FIGO's grade one and two tumors as low grade and grade three tumors to be high grade. However, for patients desiring a fertility sparing approach, it will still continue to be necessary to distinguish between grade ones and two tumors as grade one tumors may be managed conservatively, whereas grade two tumors generally are not. The binary grading system has been shown to be equal or superior to the three-tiered FIGO system in terms of inter-observable variability. In clinical practice, determining FIGO grade is not always that clear-cut. Some pathologists consider the growth of a microacinal growth pattern as, being con as constituting solid proliferation, although FIGO does not specifically address this. Now, for the purpose of grading, this JIP has recommend, has, is regarding a confluent microacinal pattern to constitute solid growth, although they admit that this is not really evidence-based. They would also consider a tumor to be FIGO grade 3 if the solid areas, which constitute more than 50% of the tumor, resembles poorly differentiated non-keratinizing non squamous cell carcinoma. Not infrequently, we come across patients with low-grade 
endometroid tumors present within the endometrium and the ovaries. In these instances, we often have to determine if the tumors represent synchronous primaries or metastasis from one site to the other. Patients with simultaneous involvement of the endometrium and ovary by low-grade endometroid carcinomas often have favorable outcome, suggesting that these may represent synchronous primary lesions rather than metastatic tumors. However, recent studies have shown that such tumors are clonal in nature and probably represent metastasis from one site to the other, usually from the endometrium to the ovary. In the latest edition of the WHO, conservative management of patients with synchronous endometrial and ovarian endometroid carcinoma should be considered when the following criteria are met. So both tumors have to be low grade. The endometrial tumor can only show um, superficial myometrial invasion. There, be sh there should be no involvement of another site and there should be absence of extensive lymphovasculation in at any location. Lymphovascular invasion is uncommon in endometrial carcinomas and is seen in about 5 to 15% of these tumors. They're usually associated with tumors exhibiting a microcystic, elongated, or fragmented pattern or mouth pattern of invasion and can be seen with tumors with mismatch repair deficiency. Artifacts such as the displacement of tumor cells within spaces and tissue retraction due to delayed fixation can mimic lymphovascular invasion. Uh, displacement artifacts may result from surgical manipulation of the uterus or it may be induced by the appropriate grossing of a friable tumor. Artifactual displacement is more likely to occur in tumors with poor fixation or those with abundant necrosis. Clues that you may be dealing with an artifact include a discrepancy between the low stage and grade of a tumor and the extent of lymphovascular invasion a preferential involvement of thick wall blood vessels within the outer myometrium, and the presence of both benign and malignant tissue within the blood vessels, including the presence of stromal surrounding malignant glands. But this was a case which I just received last week. This was a hysterectomy specimen performed for a low-grade endometroid carcinoma. On microscopic examination, there were multiple foci of tumor lying within cleft-like spaces in the myometrium, reminiscent of lymphovascular invasion at low power. A higher power view of these foci shows the spaces conforming to the shape of the tumor islands, and the tumor was stained with a vascular endothelial markers, and these vessel-like spaces actually lack endothelial cell lining and represent very prominent um, retraction artifacts. So extensive or substantial lymphovascular invasion is defined as the presence of tumor cells in at least five vascular spaces. Although the presence of lymphovascular invasion itself does not upstage the tumor, lymph ex extensive or substantial lymphovascular invasion has been demonstrated in several studies to be an independent prognostic factor in endometrial cancers. In my synoptic reports for endometrial cancers, not only do I comment on the presence or absence of lymphovascular invasion, I now also state the number of such foci that is present within the tumor. So why is it important to quantify the number of LVSI foci? Well, data from um, two clinical trials, the PORTEC-1 and 2 trials have shown that the extent of lymphovascular invasion is an important risk factor for recurrence and or metastasis of this tumor. And patients having substantial lymphovascular invasion demonstrate a higher risk for distant metastasis and pelvic recurrences. The trial data also showed that patients with substantial LVSI would benefit from the use of external beam radiotherapy in order to reduce the risk of pelvic recurrences. Serous carcinomas are the second most commonly encountered endometrial carcinoma in clinical practice. These tumors are characterized by the presence of solid papillary and or glandular patterns uh, associated with marked nuclear pleomorphism. These tumors are by default considered to be high-grade carcinomas. Well, serous intraepithelial carcinoma is characterized by the replacement of endometrial surface or glandular epithelium by high-grade malignant cells similar to those seen in invasive serous carcinoma. These lesions can shed malignant cells and metastasize to extra uterine site and therefore should be considered to have metastatic potential, thus requiring the same meticulous staging as patients with typical serous carcinomas. 
These tumors almost always show a mutation pattern form of P53 staining and typically demonstrate diffuse staining for P16. Unlike the tubo ovarian serous carcinomas, the endometrial serous carcinomas are less likely to show diffuse expression of WT1, but focal expression can be seen in about 30% of these tumors. So mutations in the P53 gene usually result in an all or nothing aberrant P53 staining pattern by immunohistochemistry. This is characterized by a strong and diffuse expression in at least 80% of the tumor cells or complete absence of expressions in the tumor cells in the presence of appropriate positive internal control. Another form of aberrant staining pattern in the form of cytoplasmic staining with variable nuclear expression has also been described. But do note that wild type P53 expression does not necessarily exclude the diagnosis of a serous carcinoma in the appropriate clinical pathological setting. It has been demonstrated that some of these cases which show wild type expression may still harbor an underlying pathogenic P53 mutation. So in serous carcinoma, the P16 expression is typically strong and diffuse. And more recently, a now pattern of P53, P16 staining, sorry, um, similar to that observed for P53, uh, P53 has also been seen in this tumor as a result of underlying gene deletion or methylation of the CDKN2A gene. HER2 expression and or gene amplification can be seen in more than 30% of endometrial serous carcinomas. In 2018, the results of a phase two clinical trial showed that the addition of a anti-HER2 agent trastuzumab to the standard chemotherapy regime actually prolonged the progression-free and overall survival of patients with advanced stage and recurrent HER2 positive endometrial serous carcinoma. This regime was subsequently endorsed by the NCCN a year later. So in my experience, the immunoexpression of HER2 in serous carcinoma is often associated with significant intratumoral heterogeneity, which also correlates with heterogeneity of gene expression or gene amplification by in situ hybridization techniques such as FISH. So the lack of apical membrane staining is common in HER2 positive tumors with a glandular or papillary architecture, resulting in a basolateral or lateral staining pattern. This chart shows you the HER2 staining al testing algorithm for endometrial serous carcinoma based on the original clinical trial enrollment criteria. A tumor is considered to be HER2 positive if there is strong, complete, or basolateral or lateral membrane staining in more than 30% of the tumor cells, or if the fished HER2 to the CEF17 ratio is more or equals to two, or, or if the average HER2 copy number is more or equals to six. So similar to its ovarian counterparts, clear cell carcinoma of the endometrium is a tumor which can be composed of tubulocystic, papillary, and solid growth patterns, and is composed variably of cells with polygonal, cuboidal, flat, or hopneal-like cytology, and they can have variably clear to eosinophilic cytoplasm. Immunostochemically, these tumors can stain for HNF1 beta, napsin A, and even amica. So this was a paper we published a few years ago um, showing that a panel of immunohistochemical markers comprising of napsin A, HNF1 beta, ER and PR can be helpful in distinguishing endometrial clear cell carcinomas from endometroid carcinomas, including those with clear cell changes. A subset of endometrial clear cell carcinomas can also show mutation pattern P53 staining. So that is not a feature which is unique to serous carcinoma. These tumors also have um, significant molecular heterogeneity and can fall into any of the four molecular subgroups, which we will discuss later. A mixed endometrial carcinoma is a tumor composed of two or more distinct histological types of endometrial cancer, where at least one component is either a serous or clear cell carcinoma. So mixed carcinomas are actually rare and do not include morphologic variants of a specific um, histotype. They do not include tumors with an ambiguous morphology. Um, endometrial carcinoma with mucinous differentiation are not considered to be mixed carcinomas, nor are D-differentiated endometrial carcinomas or carcinosarcomas. 
Well, the previous edition of the WHO uses a 5% cutoff for the non-dominant component, but this has been removed in the current edition. So where possible, immune stains should be used to support your diagnosis. It is important to document all the morphological subtypes in a histology report, along with the approximate percentage of each component, even if the component comprises less than 5% of the tumour. Mesonephric and mesonephric light adenocarcinomas are new entities including, included in this fifth edition of the Blue Book. So mesonephric carcinomas are derived from embryolic, are derived from mesonephric duct remnants, and these are centered on the lateral wall of the uterus where these remnants usually occur. These tumors most commonly are found in the cervix, but primary vagina and uterine corpus lesion have also been described. Mesonephric light adenocarcinomas morphologically resembles mesonephric carcinoma, but they occur in the uterus and ovary without associated mesonephric remnants. The pathogenesis of these tumors is still unknown, and it's uncertain whether they represent mesonephric carcinomas that arise within the endometrium or ovary, or endometroid carcinomas that is showing some form of mesonephric differentiation. This was a case we received in consultation a few months ago. Um, the lady is a 55-year-old patient who presented with a one-month history of foul-smelling PV discharge. So endometrial biopsy and a subsequent hysterectomy was performed at an outside hospital and the specimens were sent to us for a second opinion. The endometrial biopsy specimen shows these fragments of tumor tissue with solid areas as well as fossa of glandular structure that you can see on low-power examination to be reminiscent of an endometroid carcinoma. On higher power examination of this tumor, we see the presence of these irregular small glandular spaces containing this luminal eosinophilic material. There was no squamous or mucinous differentiation identified. The tumor cells showed relatively um, low grade cytology and were quite uniform in appearance. The hysterectomy specimen contained a 3.5 cm polypoidal tumor in the anterior endometrium with some minimal myometrial invasion. Microscopic examination of the tumor shows variable architectural patterns with solid glandular and even papillary areas. So again, in certain parts of the tumor, we saw the presence of these small tubular or glandular structures with luminal eosinophilic material. Whereas in other areas, there were these larger glandular spaces, some with luminal papillary projections. The cytologic atypia of this tumor cells was at most mild, and the tumor cells often showed a round ovoid nuclei. Some of the cells had nuclear clearing and even longitudinal groove mimicking the changes seen in papillary thyroid carcinomas. Gatha-3 expression were noted in the solid and glandular areas, and there was also focal staining of calretinin. Um, luminal CD10 expression was noted. The tumor cells do not express ER or PR. So based on the morphologic features and immunoprofile, a diagnosis of mesonephric light adenocarcinoma was made. Now the tumor cells, the, the immunoexpression of this tumor is as follows. They can show variable expression for GATA3, TTF1, carotenin, and CD10. GATA3 has the highest sensitivity and specificity for distinguishing these tumors from endometroid carcinomas. CD10 expression in these tumors is typically apical or luminal, as you have seen previously. They can express PEX8 and CK7, but they are typically negative for ER and PR. They also show wild type P53 staining, and P16 expression is often this patchy mosaic pattern. So, like mesonephric carcinoma, mesonephric like adenocarcinoma often harbor. Uh, activating KRAS mutations in codon 12, but they can also harbor other genetic alterations associated with malarian tumors, such as the PIK3CA mutation. Given that these tumors can demonstrate these activating of um, KRAS mutations and PIK3CA mutations, they may respond to specific targeted therapy against these pathways. Mesonephric like adenocarcinomas have a high propensity for distant metastasis, particularly to the lung, and is associated with poor overall survival. In one reported series, the factors listed here were significantly associated with an increased risk of metastatic disease. In the current WHO classification, 
Mucinous carcinoma encompasses tumors with gastric or gastrointestinal like uh, features similar to those described within the endocervix. This does not include endometroid carcinoma with mucinous differentiation. The tumor cells usually exhibit low-grade cytologic atypia, and they show at least focal immunoexpression of one or more gastrointestinal markers such as CDX2 or MUC6. They typically do not express ER. On the whole, these tumors exhibit aggressive clinical behavior similar to the gastric type adenocarcinomas of the cervix or the vagina. So in practice, we often rely on the use of a variety of immunostains to help classify problematic tumors. But as you know, there is significant inter-observer variation even amongst expert gynecopathologists, especially with these high-grade tumors. Thus, there is a need for a more robust or reproducible way of characterizing these lesions. So in 2013, the TCGA published a large-scale molecular analysis of more than 300 endometrial cancers. And they divided these tumors into four separate categories with distinct clinical, pathological, and molecular features. These are the pole, sorry, these are the pole mutated, the MSI hypermutated, the copy number low, and the copy number high subgroups. These molecular subgroups have been shown to have prognostic significance with the pole mutated tumors having the best prognosis, even though they may look morphologically high grade, and the copy number high tumors having the worst outcome. So the ultra mutated endometrial carcinomas are characterized by mutations in the exonuclease domain of the pole gene, which result in proof reading dysfunction within, during DNA replication. These tumors have a very high mutation rate, leading to high tumor mutation burden or high TMB. The pole exonuclease domain mutations typically occur in patients with early stage yet high grade tumors, which are often associated with a very prominent lymphocytic infiltrate. Pole tumors are associated with an exceptionally favorable prognosis. The MSI or mismatch repair deficiency group is characterized by loss of nuclear expression in one or more mismatch repair proteins or microsatellite instability. This phenotype is most often associated with MLH1 promoter hypermethylation. Only a small percentage of these cases may be associated with Lynch syndrome. Tumors with MSI also tend to be high grade, may have an undifferentiated carcinoma component and is associated with a prominent lymphocytic infiltrate. These tumors are potential candidates for immunomodulatory therapies. The largest molecular subgroup consists of tumors with low copy number changes. These are referred to as endometrial carcinomas with no specific molecular profile or NSMP. They have a low TMB and they have a low copy number alterations. And this group consists mostly of grade one to two endometroid carcinomas, which can show squamous differentiation and typically express ER and PR. The copy number high subgroup is characterized by high number of co somatic copy number alterations and a low mutation rate. The majority of these tumors harbor P53 mutation, and they comprise mostly of serous carcinomas, as well as a subset of fibro-grade 3 endometroid cancers. This group is associated with an unfavorable prognosis. So how can we apply this classification in a clinical setting? Successful translation requires methods that are easy to perform and interpret, relatively low in cost, and have a reasonably short turnaround time. In short, as my clinicians would often say, we want a test that is good, fast, and cheap. So as most pathology labs do not have the resources or budget of the TCGA, we cannot rely on the fancy techniques that are used in the original study. Instead, surrogate markers have been proposed to help replicate the molecular classification in routine clinical practice. So this includes se sequencing for the mutations in the exonuclease domain of the pole gene, as well as a surrogate um, for as sorry, as well as microsatellite instability testing or M uh, IHC for MMR proteins as a surrogate marker for the hypermutated group. And P53 IHC can be used as a surrogate marker to exclude the presence of a copy number high subgroup. 
More morphological features can sometimes provide clues that you're dealing with a pole mutation. Histologically, the pole mutated tumors usually demonstrate at least some endometroid features, at least focally. They can tend to be high-grade tumors and they can show ambiguous sort of morphology. They may also have increased tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and or peritumoral lymphocytic infiltrate. There is no current immunohistochemical surrogate for pole mutation, so nucleic acid-based approaches are required to assess for pole mutational status. This may be in the form of single gene testing, such as Sanger sequencing, or a multiplex assay, such as uh, NGS. Assays which can detect tumor mutational burden, such as the Foundation 1 assay, can also be used. It has been shown that patients or tumors with a Pathogenic pole mutations can display characteristic genomic alterations, such as those highlighted here. And using this criteria, some authors have proposed a scoring system to assess these alterations, and this is known as the pole score. The pole score can be used to predict the pathogenicity of pole mutations in these tumors. Testing for mismatch repair deficiency can be performed either with the use of IHC for MMR proteins or microsatellite instability testing. Now, as you may know, MMR is dependent on the actions of several proteins which function as heterodimers. Within a cell, MLH1 dimerizes with PMS2 and MSH2 dimerizes with MSH6. MLH1 and MSH2 are the obligatory partners for their respective heterodimers. Mutations in MLH1 and MSH2 will result in degradation of the heterodimer. In contrast, mutations in MSH6 and PMS2 may not result in degradation of MLH1 and MSH2 as the function of the secondary protein may be compensated by other proteins. So MMR IHC consists of an assessment of the expression of four MMR proteins, namely MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and MS PMS2. This assay shows a high concordance with the MSI assay. So a simplified two antibody approach using just PMS2 and MSH6 has been proposed as a cost effective alternative, but this usually requires you to perform MLH1 and MSH2 staining in cases with any abnormal staining of PMS2 or MSH6. Now, most labs with IHC capabilities will be probably be capable of performing MMR IHC. Uh, and the technique also has the added advantage of being able to identify the mutated gene compared to MSI testing. It is also able to detect MMR deficient cases that can potentially be missed by MSI testing, specifically MSH6 mutations, which tend to be associated with microsatellite stable tumors and tend to occur more frequently in the endometrium than in the colon. MMR IHC is very fixation sensitive and poorly fixed areas typically tend to show false negative staining. This table shows you the commonly encountered loss of staining patterns of MMR proteins and their aso underlying associated genetic defects. So loss of MLH1 and PMS2 would most likely be due to a MLH1 hyper uh, promoter hypermethylation, or less commonly to, uh, due to MLH1 gene mutation. Whereas a loss of MSH2 and MSH6 will be due to a defect in MSH2 or APCAM. Lost, isolated loss in the expression of MSH6 or PMS2 would be attributed to defects in MSH2 and M PMS2 respectively. This was another case um, which we just received recently. Again, a hysterectomy specimen for a low-grade endometrite carcinoma with focal mucinous differentiation. Uh, the tumor cells show loss of MLH1 and PMS2 in the presence of positive internal control. The expression of MSH2 and 6 was retained, so the staining profile would likely be secondary to MLH1 promoter hypermethylation or a mutation in the MLH1 gene. Now, what are some of the issues that can occur with the interpretation and reporting of MMR IHC? Firstly, there is no standardized terminology that is used. The College of American Pathologists recommends using the term intact or loss instead of positive and negative to avoid confusion, whereas ISGIP recommends reporting staining patterns as being normal or abnormal 
or defective or deficient as uh, alternative. You may sometimes encounter cases in which both the tumor and the internal control show weak or loss of expression. This may be due to poor tissue fixation or technical issues with the IHC. So try repeating a stain either on the same or another block or perform um, MSI testing to confirm your findings. As with any gene defect, there could be truncated protein showing weak or very focal expression. Such cases should not be reported as normal. The staining in tumor cells should generally be stronger than that of the internal control and be present throughout the tumor. Normal expression of the MMR proteins can sometimes be seen in the presence of an, a mismatch repair defect, as it is possible for a non-functional protein to show some retained antigenicity. Therefore, normal expression does not totally exclude a genetic defect, and this should be stated as a caveat in your report. MLH1 loss can show punctate nuclear staining in the minority of cases, particularly with the use of a, uh, the Roche M1 antibody. Rare cases may show cytoplasmic staining. This could be due to an underlying technical defect. The stain should be reported, uh, should be repeated, and if the results still show um, it to be cytoplasmic staining, the results should be reported as abnormal. Tumor progression and high mutation rates can sometimes result in the development of MMR defective subclones in any cancers. So subclonal loss could represent an underlying genetic defect, and ISGIP recommends that it should be reported as abnormal, although there is no strict definition of what constitutes a subclonal loss at this point. Another method commonly used to identify mismatch repair defect is MSI testing. Studies have shown that monoclonal markers have higher specificity and similar or better sensitivity compared to dinucleotide markers for the detection of an MSI high phenotype. Um, in my lab, we use a commercially available Promega kit which analyzes five mononucleotide microsatellite markers and a shift in any two of these markers indicate an MSI high tumor. So the advantages of using MSI testing over MMR IHC is that it can potentially identify patients with defective DNA mismatch repair, but intact immune staining as a result of non-truncating mutations or defects in gene other than the four MMR proteins that are routinely tested. Disadvantages are that it's generally higher in cost, it has a longer turnaround time, and some assays re actually require some form of normal tissue for comparison. So several organizations, including the WHO, EastGIP, and NCCN, currently recommends universal testing for mismatch repair deficiency in all cases of endometrial carcinomas, irrespective of the age of the patient. This is because more than 50% of female Lynch syndrome patients present with a gynecologic cancer as the sentinel malignancy, and up to 17% may not meet the Amsterdam or Bethesda criteria for Lynch syndrome screening. Diagnosing of Lynch syndrome is important because it allows for screening and prevention of cancer in patients and their relatives. Testing for mismatch repair defects by IHC or MSI methods does not directly identify patients to have Lynch syndrome because these events could be due to somatic mutations or hypermethylation. So in the absence of hypermethylation of MLH1, referral to genetic counseling is recommended to evaluate for the presence of germline mutation. And importantly, when the clinical history is highly suspicious for Lynch syndrome, genetic counseling referral is still recommended irrespective of the MMR um, status. Besides its use as a screening tool for Lynch syndrome, testing for MS uh, mismatch repair deficiency also has other value. So these um, changes has prognostic uh, value as shown by the TCGA and may be predictive of use for, of, uh, for specialized targeted therapy such as immunotherapy. So a mismatch repair deficiency phenotype is also a feature associated with endometroid subtype and supports characterization of a tumor as an endometroid carcinoma in cases with ambiguous or serous like morphology. BF3 IHD staining has been recommended as a surrogate marker to exclude the co copy number high subgroup. There are four main, four main patterns of P53 staining that have been described. 
The first three patterns seen here are termed abnormal or aberrant or mutation type, and they are strongly predictive of underlying P53 gene mutation. Now, the type of P53 staining should be reported as wild type or abnormal or aberrant, and the type of and the pattern of staining should be indicated in the pathology report. P53 staining should not reported should not be reported as positive or negative, as this kind of terminology is both confusing and ambiguous. These are examples of different types of P53 staining, P53 staining patterns that you may encounter. And the top left, we have a tumor showing normal wild type pattern of P53 expression with variable proportion of the tumor cells showing variable staining intensity. At the top right, we have a tumor showing overexpression of P53. Almost all the nucleus of this tumor shows strong expression of P53 compared to the much weaker staining in the um, internal control seen here in the center of this tumor. The bottom left shows an example of a tumor with complete absence of P53 or now patterned P53 staining in the presence of a positive internal control. And the last pattern of staining, which is also the most uncommon pattern that you may see, associated with aberrant P53, uh, with an uh, underlying P53 mutation is that of a cytoplasmic um, expression of P53. So using the surrogate markers, which we have discussed earlier, the Vancouver group developed a molecular classifier, which they term promised to assign patients with endometrial carcinomas to four molecular subgroups based on the combination of mutation and protein expression analysis. This classifier was tested on two separate cohorts of patients and was found to show good correlation with clinical outcomes similar to what was observed with the original TCGA study. The group then used this classifier to assess whether molecular classification could be obtained on um, diagnostic endometrial specimens obtained prior to surgical staging and its concordance with molecular classification performed on the subsequent hysterectomy specimen. And they found that there was a high concordance between the biopsies and hysterectomy specimens, which even outperformed the concordance of grade and histotypes in these tumors. So potentially, this would mean that pathologists may be able to test for molecular features in the endometrial biopsy or curatage samples, and this would enable earlier and more informed decision-making for both patients and the physicians. So for example, detection of a pathogenic pole mutation in the young women with otherwise high-grade looking tumor may allow the clinician to consider a more conservative approach, given that these tumors are associated with an excellent prognosis. Molecular subtyping of endometrial cancers has also been incorporated into the clinical trial setting. So for example, the PORTEC-3 is a randomized clinical trial investigating the benefit of combined adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy versus radiotherapy alone for women with high-risk endometrial cancers. Using the FFPE samples from the PORTEC-3 trial participants, the authors investigated the prognostic relevance of the molecular classification and the relationship between the molecular subgroups and benefit from adjuvant therapy in these patients with high-risk endometrial cancers. So they performed immunohistochemistry histochemistry for P53 and MMR protein and did DNA sequencing for pole and was able to classify the tumors into one of these four molecular subtypes. As you can see, there was no clear correlation between histological and molecular subtypes. For example, the grade three endometroid tumors may fall into any of the four molecular subgroups. Similarly, the other histotypes of endometrial carcinomas have also been shown to be molecularly diverse. So results from this analysis showed that the molecular classification has a strong prognostic value in high-grade endometrial cancers, with pole mutants demonstrating an excellent prognosis, while P53 mutants were associated with the worst recurrence-free and overall survival. This data also showed that patients with P53 abnormal tumors benefited from an aggressive adjuvant regime consisting of both chemotherapy and radiotherapy, irregardless of histotype. While patients with pole mutants, well, sorry, while patients with pole mutations showed excellent outcomes in both arms of the trial, suggesting that these groups of patients do not require aggressive adjuvant therapy, irregardless of stage and histotype. So in 2020, the European Society for Gynecological Oncology, their radio 
Therapy and Oncology, as well as the European Society of Pathology, published joint guidelines for the management of endometrial cancer. And for the first time, they incorporated the molecular, strati- the molecular classification into the risk stratification for endometrial CA. So the European guidelines propose two alternative approach to stratify the risk of patients with endometrial cancers based on whether molecular classification is available or not. Essentially, all patients with stage one and two pole mutant tumors, regardless of FIGO grade, histotype or LVSI are included in the low risk group. This implies that these cases would be managed by observation alone with no need for adjuvant therapy. All P53 abnormal endometroid tumors were lumped together with the non-endometroid carcinomas. And in the absence of myometrial invasion, these tumors were considered to be of intermediate risk, while tumors showing myometrial invasion was considered to be of high risk. For the MMR deficient and the NSMP subgroups, which have intermediate prognosis, FIGO grading, LVSI, and the depth of invasion remains to be important to be Um, important for risk assessment. So rarely a tumor may show the presence of two or even three molecular signatures. And it has been shown that outcomes of these tumors likely correspond to that predicted by the driver subtype. So for example, a tumor with both P53 um, aberrant C and PO mutation, um, the behavior of this tumor would most likely be that of a like a PO mutated tumor. However, the number of these cases reported in literature is still very low, and I think more evidence will need to be gathered before we can confidently predict the behavior of such tumors. So in summary, I've discussed some of the salient changes included in the latest edition of the WHO classification involving endometroid and non-endometroid carcinomas, including the use of a binary grade in endometroid carcinomas, the issue of synchronous endometrial and ovarian tumors, and the prognostic relevance of the presence of substantial lymphovascular invasion in these tumors. I've also illustrated the different patterns of P53 and P16 staining in serous carcinomas and discussed the recommended criteria for HER2 scoring in these tumors. So the current WHO classification of female genital tract actually endorses the use of molecular classification together with the traditional clinical pathological parameters um, to guide clinical management and to for and to ensure more accurate prognostication of these tumors, particularly in high-grade cancers. This can be achieved through the use of the various surrogate markers, which we have discussed previously. So in summary, poor mutant tumors are associated with excellent prognosis with no need for adjuvant therapy for patients with stage one or two tumors. The MMR defective tumors show intermediate prognosis and may respond to immunotherapy. The copy number low subgroup is heterogeneous and may be further stratified into different risk groups using other um, myomarkers. And the copy number high group is associated with poor prognosis, but a subset of these tumors may respond to anti-HER2 therapy. This table shows the the definition of the different prognostic risk groups based on molecular classification of endometrial cancers, which can be used to guide therapeutic decisions. Universal testing for mismatch repair defect using MMR is recommended for all patients with endometrial cancers. MLH1 hypermethylation studies can be performed on tumors showing loss of MLH1 and PFNS2 staining. And in the absence of hypermethylation, referral for genetic counseling is recommended to evaluate for a presence of underlying germline mutation. Similarly, patients with loss of MSH2 and or, or MSH6 expression should also be referred for genetic counseling. So over the next few years, I believe we will see further refinement and improvement made to the molecular classification of endometrial cancers. New biomarkers may be identified, which will guide prognostication and guide therapy, such as the use of CTNNB1 and ERID1A mutations to further stratify tumors within the NSMP group. There will also be more clinical trials guided by a combination of traditional clinical, pathological, and molecular risk profiles. And also, I believe there will be more trials exploring the use of targeted agents or combination regimes. So this concludes my talk for today. I thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Diner, for that. Uh, comprehensive, you know, extensive coverage of all the endometrial cancers and the issues in endometrial cancer as we move on to molecular classification. I think we are flooded with questions, I think, uh, with, you know, 
endometrial yeah. cancer is something that uh, you know everyone sees around and obviously that's the reason um, i can i can start off with a few few of them could i could i could i start off with the kush uh, sure yeah yeah uh, um, we have our, our own uh, you know speaker dr bharat you know ne- wanting to ask you on your experience on heterogeneous pattern of p53 immunostaining what i yes. understand what he has mentioned is you know there are sometimes areas of diffuse and areas of wide type so in endometrial cancers and what should be your experience on such people staining yes i i would say in most most cases the expression is quite clear cut it's either it's, it does fall into that all or nothing sort of category but i agree there are definitely cases where i do see it's a heterogeneity in um in expression and some of these i believe may be due to um underlying pore mutation so the patient may have underlying pore mutation and then the tumor progressed and acquired somehow somehow acquired a p53 uh, mutation later on in some subclones so resulting in this very heterogeneous staining pattern so sometimes if i'm not sure i actually will repeat the stain in another block to see whether the staining pattern is still heterogeneous or is um it's perhaps the first time the first um like that i'm seeing the heterogeneous pattern may not be the real may not be a real form of uh, aberrancy that i'm seeing so repeating it may help but but definitely there are tumors with um true heterogeneity in the, the expression and some of these could be due to underlying a uh, pore mutation so i i if i the problem does not re- get resolved we repeated um uh, staining i will actually just report that in a uh, that that finding in my uh, pathology report so i actually do report the the heterogeneity of p53 expression that i see sometimes and then say i cannot be confident on whether it's clearly over expressed or or it's abnormal or it's uh, uh, it's a normal form of staining pattern and in the same light uh, you know when you when you get the p53 negativity in a serous carcinoma mm. uh, you know how 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 do you deal with that So the first thing I look for is the presence of positive internal control. If I do not see positive internal control, then I uh, there's, there's a high chance that this what I'm seeing could be a false negative staining. So again, I repeat it either on the same or different block to confirm my result. If I still do not see um, good P53 uh, uh, P53 expression in the form of internal positive control, whether in the stroma cells or in the vascular endothelial cells, then I, I will say that the result is not interpretable for this case. it could be due to like for example post fixation of the tumor i think uh, another thing question is hovering around pole mutations and pole mutations are becoming such an important thing you know in fact much of uh, the molecular classification actually starts with pole mutations yes. and uh, and that's that's one of the problems in this particular molecular classification and uh, so and, and more so it really defies you know also whether you have to really look at uh, you know is morphology becoming now a redundant thing because with with the way pole mutations are completely changing uh, even treatment protocols uh, what you know some of the questions you know are relating to the pole is on your experience with pole mutations you know uh, uh, any particular uh, particular uh, you know uh, you know what is the percentage of pole mutations in general that you see around in your in your cases and any particular uh, you know uh, guideline or something while while you look at pole mutation how is that clinicians are taking to this i um the reported figures i think international figures have been about what 7 to 12% is reported in some series but in my experience i think in my co- local cohort we have seen a lower number but i think that could also be because we are not testing all patients so in singapore um we do not routinely test for pole mutations in all patients because first of all the patients pay for the test uh, so it depends on whether you know there's a question of whether they can afford um the 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 mutational studies or not so we actually try to try it again based on histological features so if um i have a tumor which is high grade and has some um, bigger looking features or there is a very prominent lymphocytic infiltrate perhaps i will state in my report to say that there's a risk or potential that this could be a pole mutant tumor and suggest to the clinician that they may want to recommend testing the other way the 
clinicians are recommending patients for poor mutational studies is if um, the clinical risk factors uh, make it important for a poor mutant to be known. So for example, in a grade one stage 1A, 1A G1 tumor, it's not so important to know whether it's a a poor mutant because these are very low grade tumors and very low risk to begin with. And my, in Singapore, generally, they will not be offered a juvenile therapy anyway. So in the, the, there are those uh, where you know whether the knowing whether it's poor mutant will will change management. So if they are poor mutant, they may, they may not um, offer them a juvenile. In those in those cases, the clinicians will recommend poor mutation studies. Uh, another question which has come is, is regarding the LVSI counting, you mm. know, the guidelines on LVSI counting. So your, your impressions on that? Okay, I, I must admit this has given us a lot of problem because in the past we were just happily saying whether it was present or not present and now we have to meticulously look through every slide and count the number of focus between because like four and five now makes a difference because obviously five falls in the category of extensive uh, lymphovascular invasion. So the recommendation in terms of sampling is like at least one block per cm tumour. And then um, you screen through the, the slides to look for foci, and you're not sure whether it's a foci of LVSI, you can perform um, uh, vascular endothelial staining to, to confirm your findings. Right. Uh, another thing that, uh, you know, among the, the questions that have come is, that, you know, on the relevance of NGS, or, you know, what could be your panel? Because you have now HER2 testing also coming up. So what would be your panel, you know, that you would recommend on a industry chemistry or for that matter, a broader panel, or would you go for some kind of gene panels, small gene panels in endometrial cancer, or how much of NGS do you do, you do yeah. in, your, in your routine testing? So we are still relying on single gene testing for the poor mutation um, studies, um, simply because now you can use um, IHC as a surrogate markers for the other subgroups, right? But if you were, for example, wanting to come out with NGS panel, I, I don't think I would just restrict it purely to endometrial cancers. You probably co consider combining it with other more common uh, cancer subtypes like colon and, and lung cancer, for example, that are com common in Singapore. So if I were to come out with an NGS panel now, I would incorporate other genes. I, I probably would not restrict it uh, strictly to, for endometrial cancer. I think it would make more sense for that panel to be multi-purpose rather than just for endometrial cancers. Yeah. So I think that that would be a way to make it a more cost-effective um, uh, panel if you were wanting to come out with one. A small gene panel, but relevant genes pertinent to a few cancer subtypes rather than just one particular cancer type. Right. I, I think, uh, thank you so much. Dr. Diana, for having spent your, your, your precious time with us and, and, uh, and, and really disturbing you on a late evening. Thank you so much for answering all the questions uh, and uh, really keeping all the you know, participants glued to, to listening to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Diana. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Diana and Ajit, sir. So we are moving on to the next talk. I welcome Dr. Sunita Thomas to introduce the speaker for this session. Madam is a senior consultant pathology at Rajagiri Hospital, Kochi, which is one of the most prominent uh, hospital in Central Travancore. Over to you, ma'am. A warm good evening to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank Rajan sir, Dr. Ani and IEPM Kerala chapter for giving me this opportunity. Now we move on from the most commonly seen endometrial carcinoma to the rarer vaginal and vulval lesions, which are much uh, less common compared to the other sites in the female genital tract. And again, there are a number of uh, mesenchymal tumors which occur in the vulva, some of which are quite specific to this region. I am extremely privileged to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Bharat Reiki, who will enlighten us with a potpourri of cases of vaginal and vulva tumors. Dr. Bharat Reki is a familiar name among us pathologists, and he's presently working as Professor of Pathology, Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai, and has over 21 years of experience. His areas of interest are the soft tissue and bone tumors, gynec pathology, related cytopathology, and molecular pathology. 
He has over 268 national and international publications, has contributed to over 43 book chapters and reviewed more than 69 journals. He was a responsible author for WHO soft tissue of two chapters for WHO soft tissue and bone tumors fifth edition. He's, edit, he's also the editor for various reputed journals and is a former convener bone and soft tissues disease management group and is a member of the gynecology disease management group. Dr. Bharat Reki is known as a great teacher and is an invited member and speaker for many renowned international courses. Without further ado, sir, I would like to welcome Dr. Bharat to deliver the presentation. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunita, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's really such a privilege and honor to be a part of the prestigious Kerala chapter. And I particularly want to thank uh, Professor Rajan for inviting me. It's always wonderful uh, being with this part of the Kerala chapter. You know, I've been earlier to bone and soft tissue, and it's been always a very, very um, a wonderful experience interacting with such excellent delegates. So uh, I'm here to present on a potpourri of interesting uh, tumors related to the vulvar vagina region. Are my slides uh, visible clearly? Yes, yes. I just make it full screen. So the plan of my talk in terms of the learning objective is going to be, we'll look at uh, about the WHO classification of vulvar and vaginal Sorry, tumors. Sorry, sir, can I interrupt you now? Uh, your screen is not full screen. Is it full screen now? I have done it from my I side. Know, sometimes what happens, can you just do a full screen, then you share it? Okay, then I'll just stop share and then I'll reach, uh, I think, share it. Is that better? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the WHO classification, the recent concepts that have happened in vulvar vaginal tumors before we jump on to some interesting cases, which um, I always like to associate with the treatment related indication that makes us more, you know, uh, understanding our value as a part of the disease management group or multidisciplinary team. And then finally, I'll wrap up my talk with some uh, takeaways or messages. So if you look for the postgraduates or the undergraduates, I mean, you know, just briefly looking at the uh, vulva, it's interiorly, uh, you know, you have the mons pubis, posteriorly anus, the lateral inguinal folds on the either sides and set to defectus vagina, uh, composed of labia majora and minora, more the mucosal side, the drainage lymph nodes are inguinal femoral. So mostly the biopsies are restricted to about, about you know, having lesions which are inflammatory or maybe uh, intraepithelial or uh, intracular or the uh, precursor lesions or carcinoma that are more often uh, seen in this uh, region. And that brings me to the uh, classification that we have for the tumors of the vulva, be it epithelial tumors that are substratified into squamous uh, lesions that are inflammatory, including cartiloma acuminata, to squamous cell tumors and their precursors. Now we have terminologies. If we have the HPV associated, we call them as cells, squamous intraepithelial lesions, or if it's an HPV independent, then we call it as vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia. So that is happening across the cervix, uh, vagina, and vulva that we have to, uh, I think, preferably subtype the in situ or the early, you know, the uh, precursor lesions or the frank carcinomas into HPV associated or non HPV associated. Glandular tumors and cysts include the mammary type glandular lesions, and then you have the Bartholin gland cysts, the adenocarcinomas, which include uh, Paget's disease association, and also carcinomas of the sweat gland uh, origin. And uh, interestingly, the adenocarcinoma of the intestinal type are pretty rare. And then rarely you can also see the germ cell tumors of the vulva. Neuroendocrine tumors are just as a common, I mean, as one uh, chapter, which includes uh, tumors happening at various sites in the tract. Likewise, in vagina, also you have the epithelial tumors uh, subtype into squamous and glandular, and further uh, squamous being inflammatory or the benign lesions. And then you have the precursor lesions, which are again subtype into intraepithelial lesions, uh, which could, could be HPV associated or non HPV. Like I reiterate in Volva, you have the uh, terminology cell for the HPV associated, and you call the vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia for the non HPV associated. And likewise, you substratify squamous carcinomas into these two uh, important types. 
Now, glandular tumors, if you look at the adenocarcinomas, they're just like in cervix, you have the endometrioid, the clear cell, mucinous uh, gastric type, which is aggressive. You have the intestinal type, mesonephric adenocarcinoma, and then you can have carcinosarcomas. We don't use the term MMMTs, including in the endometrium in the WHO classification. And then you have the mesenchymal types uh, of the tumors. Uh, you might have adenosarcomas as the, uh, you know, the counterpart that we see in the endometrium. So brings me to case number one, that is my approach towards uh, sharing interesting cases. This came in a 35 years old lady in 2011, and that was called as a squamous papilloma for this papillomatous lesion that was nine centimeters, the largest dimension, cut surface was whitish. So I had a chance to look at the gross of this uh, while looking through the museum specimens that kind of interest and impressed me. And I felt off late when we were looking at these specimens that this looks like more uh, you know, multiple papillomas, papillomatous lesions, and perhaps you see a lot of keratinization. Very interesting cross with this cut surface white that was initially termed as. And I felt perhaps this this could be a condyloma. I just kind of reviewed this slide with a new fresh stain, and you can see this uh, nice keratinization of this papillomatous lesion with these uh, coelocytic cells across the superficial and intermediate uh, layer. Higher magnification, again, you can appreciate all these coelocytic cells, which initially was called as, uh, you know, in those 10 years uh, back, perhaps as a papilloma or papillomatosis is actually a condyloma accumulated. It just kind of tells about our conceptual understanding with the, uh, you know, more refinement in terms of morphology and the classification systems. So look at these specimens that we come across in carcinomas is the uh, vulvectomy specimen. You can see, again, for the postgraduates and the consultants pursuing dynamic pathology, that you have the clitoris as a superior aspect, and you have the labia, labia major and minor, and just alluded to the drainage lymph nodes are the inguine of femoral, and we make sure that we sample enough tumor sections, including tumor of the lateral and deep margins. This is from a cartoon from our crossing manual uh, written by my co uh, consultant and colleague, Dr. Kedar. We uh, sort of worked on uh, looking at the different uh, writing chapters for the crossing of the female genetic drug in our initial grossing manual. So now you can see microscopically how it translates into this particular case of a 53 years old lady who had itching in her perineal region with this uh, 13 to 15 millimeters uh, lesion, the upper vagina enhancing. And you see, frankly, a markedly dysplastic lesion. You can see this colocytic atypia on one aspect, and there was invasion the others. So this is perhaps a uh, squamous intraepithelial lesion, high grade or VIN. VIN we'll use if it's HPV independent, which it doesn't look like, or it's a cell hybrid. There was a component of invasion. This was squamous cell carcinoma overall. So that brings me to how we interpret the immunohistochemical staining for P53 and uh, add on sort of P16 in most cases, at least of the in situ or the intraepithelial lesion. That's a beautiful paper that appeared in modern pathology. And uh, Dr. Diane just alluded towards looking at, you know, the all or none staining of the P53. Now we have six staining patterns in the vulva. When we're looking at the early lesions, you have the two wild type patterns, you have four mutation type patterns. That uh, holds true equally for the uh, the, the, in, the early precursor lesions as well as the uh, invasive carcinomas. If you have a scattered ex, uh, expression of P53 or you have a very peculiar basal sparing and mid epithelial, that's the wild type pattern. In contrast to a basal diffuse staining pattern or a, uh, you, know, you have the mid basal, supra basal diffuse staining or you have a complete absence, or you have a cytoplasmic staining. These are all towards a mutation type of staining pattern. Similarly, likewise, you will see even in the invasive component of a carcinoma. That's the example that I just uh, showed with you. You can see this is uh, a typical block staining pattern. Every cell is positive, and that's what we you know matches towards our HPV uh, you know morphology. And you can see P53 is a very scattered pattern of this a wild type staining pattern. So this was actually squamous cell carcinoma, and that's how I like to term it, moderately differentiated, likely HPV related. Now there are no different uh, management options related to the HPV positive or HPV negative, but it's just that you have about two thirds of the vulvar carcinomas. Of course, we don't have our own uh, statistics at this point in time, which are called to be HPV non-associated. They are more aggressive in terms of their uh, clinical outcomes in contrast to the HPV positive tumors. That's it's just like you have even in the head neck location. That's another example of 74 years old lady who had a biopsy followed by vulvectomy, and it's a frank uh, keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. 
What you see here is the diffuse P53 expression. That's more like the mutation pattern. Uh, again, you're seeing here in this particular case in contrast to that scattered pattern that you saw. And this case had a very uh, focal staining pattern with P16. That's what we call as non-block. It's not a block staining pattern, which we associate generally to the HPV. So this is more like squamous cell carcinoma, likely HPV unrelated. So these markers are good surrogates, but they are not perfect. That's why I, you, you know, you use this terminology likely or preferably rather than being very absolute about it. So that's the way we report, you know, a vulvectomy specimen. We look at the gross and microscopic, and it's important to furnish all the details because the stage is influenced in terms of how much the invasion is there and the tumor size, the depth of invasion, are there LVI or there's a perineural invasion. We look at the margins uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the hemivalvectomy, which will be actually, uh, you know, uh, shown to us in terms of the orientation by the uh, treating on the surgeon. And of course, the uh, valvectomy radical, we can, orient, we, we can sort of uh, handle all the margins. And then we sample the lymph nodes regional, which I just mentioned will be inguinal and femoral nodes. So that's a li little bit more smarter way of reporting. You utilize the uh, synoptic pattern, which I think the Kerala chapter is also aiming towards your guidelines. and. Uh, I'm fine either ways with the free text or the synoptic options. And again, you can see here, we look at the maximum tumor thickness, the depth of invasion. And when I say depth of invasion, it is, you know, your, uh, the upper point will be the, uh, will be the junction between the epithelium and the stroma towards how deep uh, the tumor is. That is what the English, because it influences the stage uh, as well as the tumor size uh, in case of vulvar tissue. So we make sure that we are uh, offering this uh, details at all times in the vulvar specimens. Apart from that, we mentioned about the LBI and the perineural invasion. Of course, the lymph node states that's how the final report in terms of the impression comes across. That's another example of a straightforward uh, squamous carcinoma, 63, 60 years old lady who had a labial mass, three centimeters in the largest dimension. And you can see here, uh, P16 is negative and P53 is null mutation type. So that's what is complete absence of the P53 expression. And that's again, uh, preferably not a HPV associate. Of course, now the complete absence of P16 is also being viewed uh, with possibilities of HPV association. So this was P53 null mutation type, uh, post vulvectomy. there was a residual VI3 in this particular case. Brings me to interesting case number one in a 56 years old lady who had perineal itching about one and a half years with wide discharge. She underwent a DHB, so for a fibroid and HSI, which was diagnosed elsewhere. We get a lot of referral cases at TMH and MRI showed about 1.9 centimeters lesion in the post cervical lip. There was a leukoplectic patch uh, along the inner aspect of the labial majora, Bartholin glands extending into the vagina. So this is a very interesting, uh, you know, clinical presentation towards the location of the lesion that's kind of uh, building on towards what perhaps you might be expecting or seeing microscopically. And that's what you see here. You see, uh, you know, these cells in this form of epithelium, which is kind of a very pagetoid effect towards these cells, because you see this lesion is extending, the patient is in with itching. So that's what exactly you're seeing, a, a pejetic pattern of this uh, tumor with this inflammation. But the other fragment showed frank carcinoma that was invasive, it's kind of an adenocarcinoma, moderate to poorly differentiated. Now, trying to put across the stain, CK7 is good enough because it not only helps in highlighting the pejetic tumor, but also how much invasive component you might have with this otherwise pejet carcinoma and coexisting adenocarcinoma that we need to pick on. I utilize CRB2, which again, in this case, is not showing a strong membranous pattern. It is showing a very focal, incomplete, or maybe one uh, you know, membranous pattern. So uh, the other stains that one needs to or should apply is perhaps you know, you're looking at a primary widget or it's a secondary. So CK20 will take care of are you seeing a uh, rectal based or you know you're seeing a uh, what shall i say bladder based and then ERPR can be seen at some times and your differential includes the melanoma so you need to make sure in the pejetic tumor in vulvar locations you employ s1 and hmd45 or melani whichever you prefer to make sure you're ruling out these possibilities so which came completely negative so we were dealing with in this case uh, with a adenocarcinoma with a pejetic pattern so that's what I felt that perhaps this is a primary pages with adenocarcinoma, poorly differentiated, 
went on with additional markets, including CEA, which is again a good add on apart from a P16 that I would employ in a case like this. You can see very nicely the individual pegetic cells are decorated, as well as the diffuse staining pattern that you see in the invasive component of this tumor. P16, again, decorating the individual uh, you know, cells in the pegetic uh, you know, uh, lesion and a diffuse block staining pattern that you are seeing in this invasive atocarcinoma. So this is actually a primary pegetic disease vulva with atocarcinoma, likely HPV or maybe like an endocervical type of pattern. So that's important that we employ these stains and make sure we're not missing on an invasive component. The outcome in this case was that there was a poorly differentiated atocarcinoma with pages as we saw initially as well. Uh, there was extensive lymphatic uh, emboli, perineural invasion, and there were nodal metastases with extra nodal invasion. And that's the uh, excision. You can see this uh, Pajax in its full glory for the uh, you know postgraduates and the, uh, the the young consultants pursuing this kind of an unusual, a nice you know pejetic effect. You can see in this and the uh, same poorly deficient atrocarcinoma with this uh, peculiar perineural invasion and lymph node metastasis in this particular case. So Pajax disease of vulva arises from the labial minus or major and extends into the extra vulvar skin into the vagina and rarely into the cervical because if you remember, this tree was somewhat extension towards the cervix in this particular case, presented similarly with pruritic or erythematous or eczematous lesion that these uh, lesions present with. So they can be primary and secondary, I just alluded to, and the IHC profile uh, will be including, that you should, I think, would suggest to include a CK7 that comes consistently positive. You make sure that you're adding on the melanoma pack to rule out, unless you've seen a frank ethnocarcinoma, if you don't want to pursue uh, a, a melanoma as your differential, and uh, then you can add on her two as another uh, marker that I just showed. So the underlying mutations include PIC3, uh, AKT, which correlate with the CDH1 hypermethylation in these uh, cases. Uh, brings me to case number two of a 41 years old lady with vulvar lump of one year duration, CD enhancing ulcerative thickening of the labia majora with edematous uh, left labia majora. So again, you have a labia majora uh, lesion in this uh, 41 years old lady. And you can appreciate here, you know, these squamous epithelium, this stark, uh, you know, uh, contrast toward this more glandular and maybe dysplastic lesion, which actually, you know, at least looks like atocarcinoma in sight or it's like a high grade intraepithelial lesion. But all times you need to make sure if you're seeing a lot of inflammation, what is like beneath. And you can see this individual tumor cells scattered across this in the, uh, in the lower layer. The higher magnification showing you these uh, frankly atypical cells with this uh, beauty, uh, the, the, the vacuum that I perhaps believe it could be uh, highlighted well with our good friend, histochemical friend, uh, Musi Carmen or maybe Alcian Blue that I utilize in cases like this. So it's kind of a poorly differentiated pattern of an atocarcinoma with this overlying uh, more glandular aspect towards this tumor. And that's how Alcian Blue brings in that more intestinal kind of pattern. You see this acidic mucin, the single cells, um, you know, highlighted. That's a good way to identify your dealing perhaps with an intestinal pattern of mucinous different in this otherwise uh, endocarcinoma. So then we resort to our good next friend, immunostochemistry. We employ stain CK7 and CK20. Unfortunately, unexpectedly, CK20 was negative, but CK7 was positive. And look how nicely this highlights the underlying, uh, you know, these poorly differentiated cells or the endocarcinoma, this otherwise uh, very, very markedly dysplastic glandular uh, epithelium. So CDH2 was positive, and CA was also showing this positive expression. I prefer to call this an endocarcinoma with intestinal like differentiation that's uh, uncommon to see an atocarcinoma in this location. Like I mentioned, CK20 was negative, which would be consistently positive in most cases of intestinal differentiation. And P3 was a wild type. It was not seemingly not HPV related because that's one way when you're seeing immunosuppress differentiation, including in cervix, uh, that's less common seen in uh, you know, uh, the HPV associated. Of course, the HPV associated have their own uh, lesions, which are immunosuppress in their terms of their differentiation that we see even in cervix. So see what happened, how our morphology leads further towards looking at the, you know, the tumor market levels. The CA 19.9 is so high and uh, vaginal work was at the carcinoma. The patient was offered chemotherapy with radiation therapy adjuvant setting because these tumors are aggressive, they, uh, you know, require uh, adjuvant treatments. So well, we're at the carcinomas um, in terms of the intestinal type, I could mention the intestinal pattern in my case, but of intestinal type, it's extremely rare, uh, 40 to 70 percent, uh, 40 to 70 years is the age group. 
mostly appear as polypoidal or ulcerated lesions microscopically they're like uh, rectal ectoparsinoma you will see globular cells you will see cells with mucinous differentiation that i just showed you and you can you resort to uh histochemical stains like mucin archon blue and further on to the ic panel that should include ck720 cdx to sand b with peak 16 to make sure we're not missing on a hpv associated uh ectoparsinoma versus non or maybe these intestinal type so like you have uh, the other tumors in terms of the round cell morphology occurring in the uh, cervix or vagina when you think first of the neuroendocrine carcinoma or small cell carcinoma that uh, is considered in this particular case of the 53 years old lady who had a vulvar lesion and you can see this subtle you know apoptosis uh, across with this necrosis this uh, crush artifact you resort to neuroendocrine markers like synaptopycin and chromogranin. It's not come very brilliantly positive, but it's kind of nicely, distinctly positive, reinforces a diagnosis of neuroendocrine carcinoma or small cell carcinoma. In this particular case, so looking at back at the history of the nodes, this patient was actually of 3B cervical and, uh, uh, carcinoma of neuroendocrine type. So the patient gets uh, chemotherapy in terms of etoposide that is included for small cell carcinomas. And that's why it's important to identify this uh, more aggressive or nasty subtype and differentiate it from the other round cell morphologies. Now we're shifting gears towards more mesenchymal tumors occurring in this 40 years old lady who had a history of chronic pain and uh, you know she had uh, she was uh, diagnosed with some additions and underwent uh, ATT or antitubercular treatment. Subsequently she developed a vaginal mass that appeared interestingly as a complex cyst on ultrasonogram. And that's what you see this kind of uh, high lesion, which was perceived as more cystic in the posterior vaginal wall measuring 5.7 centimeters in the largest dimension. Microscopically, it doesn't look like a cyst anyway. So what you see here is a very, very cellular spindle cell tumor with this uh, patternless collagen across the entire tumor. So the other areas uh, make this morphology more very vivid in terms of the uh, branching vasculature. You see this uh, conspicuous hemangiopericytomatous vasculature across this otherwise monomorphic spinal cell tumor. The HPC pattern is seen more vivid in this uh, relatively higher magnification. You don't see a lot of stark atypia or maybe high mitosis, but it looks very cellular. You see this collagen very patternless way uh, filling the interstitium and also at places was around the blood vessels. So that kind of gives us a clue towards what we are dealing with. If I have to wrap up this more microscopic appearance, uh, it's a cellular monomorphic tumor. It cells are in a sheet like pattern, distinctly hemangiopericytopatous type with monomorphic you know, cells with uh, ill defined cytoplasm. We look at the cyto uh, logical characteristics. There was no significant AD, but this tumor was very cellular, uh, no mitotic figures or necrosis. Of course, there were some very subtle focal layers of mixoid change seen, and there was interestingly collagen deposition in the interstitium around the blood vessels. So when you look at a tumor like this, you know, it be it in a soft tissue site or an unusual site like this, these are the differentials, particularly in location like vagina, that you will consider, you should consider, uh, including myopericytoma, which will be showing you SMA and desmin positivity. A nerve G2 including a neurofibroma will be invariably or variably positive for S1 protein. If you want to go high end, you can include SOX10. So the one which is a very, very close differential with this tumor, maybe this could be, will show you epithelial markers variably, be it EMA or A1, E3. TLE1 is now an essential marker. Of course, it's not very specific, uh, although it's very highly sensitive. Why resort to INI1 in terms of its weak to mosaic expression? Dermatofibromas will be CD34 negative. Spindle cell epitheliomas will be cytokeratin positive. Very unusual, uh, you know, differential. Myofibroblastomas will be CD34 positive, decimate positive, actin, and they show consistently mesenchymal lineage markers like y and of course, solitary fibrous tumor, which is a ubiquitous tumor. Uh, you know, we don't use the terminology managed by cytoma anymore. They show a variable amount of CD34 positivity, maybe not diffuse, but it could be patchy, uh, along with BCL2 and MIG2. And now we have a magic marker called STAT6. And that's what we found on the CD34 expression for this case, which was very patchy positive. And that kind of takes away possibility of cerebral sarcoma that was the most close differential. Uh, you can see BCL2 again to use the positive in this particular example, and uh, it showed focal ER positivity, but first, despite high cellularity, we didn't see mitosis, it was low in MIP1. 
So it is not to something more. I wish I had the whole option that Dr. Indu was giving me, but I think it was too close. I could ask for it, you know, to have it. Uh, that's the market that one needs to think about in present times. It's diffusely nuclear positive. That's stat six. Uh, for a tumor like this, I always say stat six, and that's it. And that kind of mirrors to what, what you're seeing in terms of the HPV profile, uh, the uh, collagen, the spinal cell monomorphic pattern, and that's a solitary fibrous tumor of the vagina, very uncommon location for this uh, particular tumor. And that brings me to share with you our experience of the SFTs uh, in terms of the STAT6 as a very useful marker, which study that I did with my student, Dr. Parul Omshri, as our colleague from molecular pathology. We looked at trying to analyze the underlying uh, gene fusion that drives these tumors that's a map to STAT6. There are about eight variants towards the different exon combinations that you have. But what is good with this, uh, uh, the marker and the genetics is the marker is a mirror towards the underlying uh, fusions. One of the very few markers that you know is just mirrors the underlying genetic fusion that uh, you might not need the genetic testing for when you are trying to make a diagnosis of SFT in unusual locations like the present one. And of course, with this part of this study, we looked at about uh, 33 cases of SFT uh, including uh, all STAT6 positive and 30 showed this one of the eight uh, fusion variants. And we found apart from thorax abdominal, which is the most common sites for SFT, uncommon locations like prostate, bladder, uh, and paraspinal sites. So that's the example what we came across in vagina. And you can see this snap to STAT6 fusion seen as part of the gel photograph of this uh, uh, the, the, the particular tumor and stat 6 diffuse expression this particular case. So present case showed the exon 4, exon 2 combination. That is uh, one of the common combinations that you see in the uh, one of the eight ways that I just mentioned for the NAP2 stat 6 fusion. So looking at the literature review, then I was trying to write this uh, case up. Uh, you can see uh, these are not common. These have been reported in uh, variable age groups and uh, consistently they have been CD34 positivity, which we've been resorting to. But of course we've realized that PCD34 is not a very specific marker because you see it in DFSPs, you see it in spinal cell lipomas. I'm just talking off the hat in terms of various uh, you know, tumors across soft tissue sites. So that's not enough to call something as SFT now, and we don't use the term HPC. So it's stat six, that is uh, the marker one needs to bank on towards uh, a more robust or a clear diagnosis. Because again, the importance of this diagnosis, because if there, there's, a, there's a vast uh, differentials, you know, you can have, including a synovial sarcoma, because synovial sarcoma is a highly aggressive tumor in contrast to uh, SFT. If it's not malignant, if it's not high risk, uh, then one can just uh, get away with a excision, unlike a synovial sarcoma that might work actually therapies. So that's a case we published in IJSP as one of the very rare cases of vaginal SFTs. Uh, brings me to kind of case 4B. Uh, any comments anybody would like to jump in uh, from the panelists or any queries related to the case case that I just presented? Before I go on to this 4B, Dr. Sunita or any of the panelists would like to comment? Uh, there was a question, sir. What is the role of uh, P53 in vulval adenocarcinomas? Is yeah, so, uh, yeah, so again, you know, uh, it's like uh, we are add on towards a basic panel marker uh, in terms of uh, seeing whether it's a mutation type or not, which generally wouldn't be. But I add on like uh, uh, looking at the P16 and P53 kind of combination. So uh, it was wild that in the case that I mentioned. So it's not a necessary, but you can add on. But what I would suggest as imperative is more like P16 to stratify whether it's an HPV associated or non-HPV associated. P53 kind of tells about you know, the mutation aspect towards an, any adenocarcinoma. So that's uh, why I added on to it. Any other question? Or the ERPR, sir? ERPR, you do on the yeah. adenocarcinoma. Yeah, so ERPR is important. ERPR is essential, I would say. Well, we have a context of endometrioid versus cervical. That's one combination I, I think most of us resort to. And if you're looking at pejetic also, it's good to add on ERPR because they can be positive. That could reflect an endometrioid kind of profile towards tumor type. I would say type not an endometrium, but of course, I mean, you know, you can always know that how a tumor uh, could be uh, traversing in terms of its pejetic aspect. So ERPR uh, is is, is a good add-on apart from the P16 that I just uh, mentioned as a part of uh, widgets with uh, adenocarcinomas. Um, sir, Ani here. Sir, is it um, 
you said it's mucinous carcinoma in the cell type, right? So why it's not a uh, gastric type? But because they describe that CK20 will be uh, variable or negative in a gastric type, and it is in the sternal type, uh, it will be more positive, right? Yeah, you're right, actually. You know, somehow the, uh, uh, in terms of the morphology, uh, the way I saw the tumors, I mean, I would expect mostly 20 uh, positive and gastric type uh, carcinomas. I agree with you, it can be variable. Uh, and I wasn't seeing that uh, diffuse intestinal pattern across uh, the entire tumor. So I prefer to call it like a gastrointestinal type. And that's what I generally utilize, use this terminology. I don't call it dogmatically. It is intestinal. I say it's like a gastrointestinal type differentiation they can uh, uh, they can further investigate for any possible primary before actually calling it as uh, from there so I somehow didn't feel enough to call it as gastric type uh, because you know the way I was seeing uh, the pattern uh, there wasn't too many of that significant cell morphology across or clear it was focal goblet cell pattern and I just felt it's good enough to call it as gastric single type of differentiation uh, rather than, uh, you know, I would want to call it as gastric type, which is, but of course, I mean, gastric distinct type are relatively more aggressive than the uh, P16 positive tumor. So that's important that we add on uh, to that uh, comment that it's a gastric type of differentiation that we're seeing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, brings me to case number 4B in this youngish female who had again a lobulated mass. So you can see 10 centimeter largest dimension. That's kind of a dramatic photograph towards this large tumor size. And this was referred to, uh, by Dr. Arpita from, uh, uh, from Jaipur, I think. And that again was a very interesting spindle cell tumor, this collagen across this uh, entire tumor. Uh, and we were seeing and appreciated this HPV pattern. But of course you see this atypical cells, which can be seen. You don't see enough mitotic figures or necro in this particular case, which we didn't see. So uh, with this focal I prefer to call this, perhaps this could be another SF that we're looking in vulvar location. And this was a combined C34 stat 6 positive. Further, it showed exon 6, exon 17, mutation fusion. Uh, and of course, uh, we published this in IGPM. Now that's one of the large series of these SFTs in female genital tract comes from Marisa Nucci and Dr. Fletcher. They found vagina single case and vulva is relatively more propensity for this otherwise ubiquitous tumor. 90% of their tumors were stat 6 positive. This kind of reflects that how useful this uh, marker is in reinforcing the diagnosis of this uh, ubiquitous tumor. So brings me to case number five of this 17 years old late young girl who had this uh, very uh, intriguing history of this uh, vaginal discharge with this fragmented bits. At that time, she had taken some alternative treatment and came up with this sizable tumor with the 4D scatterer in situ. She underwent a certain investigation. That's what you can see there at the large mass of this Foley catheter in situ. And that was microscopically the appearance of the tumor round cell morphology. And when you see this in the female genital tract, you will be compelled to consider it as a small cell carcinoma as your first uh, differential choice. And But you're seeing this tumor in this young patient. So you make sure that you're not missing on any other round cell present common tumor. So the differential that you would consider for this otherwise monomorphic round cell tumor that they were they were initially considered were uh, could it be a Ewing sarcoma or a cerebral sarcoma poly differentiated uh, came into our uh, you know the uh, the multidisciplinary group and I was asked to review and I said that yes this is a more morphic tumor morphology and you have cerebral poly differentiated as a differential there's no HPC HPC pattern I would more err towards the possibility of Ewing uh, sarcoma and uh, we looked at certain markers of course epithelial markers were negative BCL2 was showing this wishy washy uh, MIG2 came out as membranous and fly one is not a very specific mark. It's kind of reinforces your morphology towards consideration of humans in a context like this. And of course, now we have NKX 2.2, which we didn't have at that point in time. So we resorted to more uh, definite molecular. This particular case was fly one, it was positive, an unusual case of uh, uh, the Ewing sarcoma in this uh, vaginal location. The patient was induced on this uh, particular chemotherapy protocol. So she had a response with a uh, survival benefit of about 12 months. This kind of tells us that, you know, you can pick up this uh, round cell tumor goes for a specific chemotherapy protocol and maybe patients can benefit. So this, uh, that time I kind of looked at how many cases of uh, humans have been seen in vaginas kind of 30, 40 years old 
age group uh, frequently appears our case was pretty young and of course mig 2 was being utilized at that point in time you can see in terms of the treatment uh, mostly uh, chemotherapy is included maybe in a new adjuvant setting if the tumor is extensive or in adjuvant settings if the tumor is excised because it's a high grade chemosensitive sarcoma so the chemotherapy is important and that's what makes this diagnosis very very important and to differentiate from small cell carcinoma because those are the tumor is very aggressive and they get uh, different chemotherapy in terms of the etoposoid that is added on apart from platinum based genes. So that's another interesting case that I came across in Valva. It's kind of a success story to what you see this 10 years old girl who unfortunately presented with this simultaneous lung meds and um, vaginal tumor seen in this FBG pet. And you can see morphologically, this was a round cell tumor, which was MIG2 positive. So MIG2 is not enough in present times to reinforce the diagnosis of human sarcoma at uncommon locations like this one. So we resorted to something more. And you can see this EWSR split signals to reinforce the diagnosis of urine sarcoma. The patient was induced on chemotherapy and post-induction. Uh, you can see the lesions are not seen as they were seen before on PET. She got a survival benefit of 8 to 12 months, but unfortunately had a recurrence. So that kind of propelled me towards looking at how many urine sarcomas we can see or identify in the female genital tract. I just showed you one. We had additional two cases in vagina, one additionally in vulva, cervix, and in perineum. And that's an example of a vulvar urine sarcoma reinforced uh, diagnosis with MIG2 and fly one. And this is a perineal urine sarcoma you can see with this uh, MIG2 positivity with this EWSR break apart. Uh, that's again to mention that EWSR is kind of a promiscuous gene reading when you need to utilize this in a context like this to call something as urine sarcoma standalone. Nothing is perfect, like we just discussed that, you know, even for molecular classification of endometrial carcinoma, it's always the morphology I see in molecular, that's the perfect gold standard. So brings me to case number six. Uh, I don't know how much time we have. Uh, are we good with time, Dr. Sunita? And, uh, or shall I wrap up fast? Yes, we have another 20 minutes. All right. Okay. So we have a case of this 51 years old lady with a vaginal mass. You can see this squamous epithelium and you see this non-descript kind of uh, diffuse, uh, you know, pattern of cells. And that's again, kind of round cell morphology. You see this subtle apoptosis, maybe a dropout necrosis and age is a very important uh, parameter in a case like this. So you have this old patient. Again, you would think perhaps this could be a small cell carcinoma. That was the first thought, and this was negative for the endocrine markers as well, as well as it was negative for the epithelial markers to think about, you know, or rule out possibility of any poorly differentiated carcinoma. Now, I would just like to bring in a point of CD56 as a it's not overall a very useful uh, or specific endocrine marker, but in a location like cervix, we found it's good sensitivity. It's not very specific, and now you have the ISM, uh, so you can add on towards your panel of synapto chromo and CD6 as a good panel, and two markers at least should be positive to call something or reinforce a pattern of neuroendocrine differentiation. So this was negative in this case. So you have an oldish patient, you know, old elder patient, I would say, with this round cell morphology in this pattern. It's important to make sure that you're not missing on a unusual lymphoma that this, this tumor turned out to be diffusely LCNC20 positive. So it was like a blasted morphology occurring in an older patient. And you can see the CD10 is again positive. K67 was more than 90% reinforcing again uh, a very plastic morphology. See how this uh, goes on towards the treatment. So the patient was induced on four cycles of chemotherapy in terms of the R epoch that they give for hybrid B cell lymphomas, aggressive, because you know you won't consider easily a plastic morphology in older patient, uh, which this uh, tumor was. And uh, further on, this patient, uh, you know, unfortunately had residual disease. So they switched on to this BHM I just picked on from the EMR roads, which is offered for the blastic lymphomas and uh, this patient uh, did not have recurrence. So this just kind of tells this aggressive uh, blastic lymphomas do respond to chemotherapies and unusually in this age, which generally happens in younger patients. So it brings me to case number seven of this 44 years old lady who had a gradually increasing vulvar tumor of about six months duration, locally two centimeter size nodular lesion, which was heterogeneously enhancing on CCT and she had also bilateral inguinal lymph nodes. 
And what we see here is a frankly very epithelial morphology. The nuclei are just staring at us in node magnification, just kind of brought it on the higher magnification to bring in more the epithelioid characteristics of this uh, tumor. So it looks pretty, you know, you will think as the carcinoma, but if you see even higher magnification, that's what I would like to add on towards, you know, my two pens or two annas for the postgraduate. This is a rhabdoid morphology. You see this nucleus with this prominent nucleoli and this intracytoplasmic inclusion pushing towards nucleus towards this one side this is pan across the entire tumor due to this epithelial to rhabdoid morphology so when you see this in this patient you resort to the epithelial markers and this was positive do you limit yourself towards calling this as a convenient carcinoma at this point in time or would you want to consider further well i think so because you know if you see offhand in younger patients of this, uh, you know, you think about in soft tissue sites, a proximal epithelial sarcoma is what that you would consider in a tumor like this. So I resorted to CD34 positivity, which is kind of a good mesenchymal tumor, and it comes in about 50, 60 percent cases of epithelial sarcoma, irrespective of the conventional classical or proximal or the hybrid types that we have in terms of the three morphological flavors of epithelial sarcoma that we have. And um, intriguingly, interestingly, the proximal type occurs more in the you know the the location like vulva perineum in, in men and vulva in or perineum in women so what further we go towards is uh, employing this uh, smart b1 or ini1 that is completely lost in the tumor cells in contrast to the uh, endothelial cells or the inflammatory cells that are scattered serving as a good control and helping to reinforce the diagnosis of proximal large cell epithelial sarcoma in this particular case why it's important because carcinomas again in terms of you know, uh, if they are you know, occurring in these uh, soft tissue sites, they will be perhaps thought to be like a uh, metastasis and they will give a sort of chemotherapy in contrast to a different chemotherapy regime that might be offered to epithelial sarcoma. Uh, but of course, they are more local regionally dealt in terms of excision with options of radiation therapy because they are not generally chemo uh, sensitive. Of course, now we have targets like the azimatostat, which is offered to those recurrent widespread epithelial sarcomas that are being under investigation for these sort of clinical trials headed by uh, oncologists at the Memorial Sloan Kitchen. So this was negative for S1. You need to make sure you're not missing on a melanoma. Of course, they don't show epithelial markers that this tumor showed. And it was also negative for P6340, ruling out your uh, good differential common of a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. That's the uh, excision. You can see this uh, typical knot you will see in this vulvectomy specimen, uh, you know, well-oriented, a kind of unusual morphology it translates microscopically towards you looking at this central necrosis, which we generally see in classical type, but the cell type is more a uh, rhabdoid. So this is a proximal type epithelial sarcoma. And just uh, recently, my colleague from surgical oncology was very excited to pull out the cases of proximal epithelial sarcoma in Walwa. They published about four cases and the median age is 37 years. Uh, mostly, uh, you know, they are dealt with surgical resection. You can see our very eminent uh, surgical oncologists I've been fondly working with, uh, Dr. Shaila Shri and Dr. Amita, and are very, very active oncologists. Dr. Jyoti works on all the new magic, uh, you know, uh, drug targets. So um, uh, these tumor, this site is dealt mostly with surgery. You can see here, of course, these are, these can be innocuous. They can uh, end up in uh, metastasis. So patient was offered palliation in, uh, you know, a single uh, a patient was offered because of the widespread disease. The patient on a limited follow-up, two or three of disease, but of course there was recurrences in lung. And that was one of the reasons to offer adjuvant chemotherapy in one of these four cases that I just shared with you. So coming to my final aspects with this interesting case of a 70 years old lady, uh, not a very nice slide, must apologize for this poor magnificence. Just kind of to share with you this uh, tumor occurring below the squamous epithelium in this anterior vaginal wall. And that's maybe a better version of the higher magnificence. You see this again, round to oval cell morphology. So we're just, you know, looking at certain differentials that you will see for these round to oval cells. But this kind of a little a sudden pleomorphism and the mitotic figures that you can see across this entire tumor. And this failed for our usual panel of the lymphoma, epithelial markers, and neurocrine markers. So from here, where do we go next? I think if you see 
a sudden nuclear pleomorphism dome miss out on these two markers that is the S100 and HMB45 that was diffusely positive. And this was a malignant melanoma, a melanotic type. The outcome, the patient was lost to follow that sometimes sadly happens, but I could fetch out the details that there were conglomerate masses along the Eli vessels that the patient has. So what's the, mass, the mystery masquerader? I always, you know, uh, like to add on or finish my talk with this uh, is a melanoma that we need to bear in mind. Uh, you can resort to your IHC stains with your morphological triggers that I just alluded to. And finally, wrapping these cases with some take home messages, I would like to initiate saying that it's imperative to differentiate HPV related or non HPV related, uh, you know, cells, which we call as the HPV related or the VINs, which we call as HPV non related, kind of terminology, but we are falling for the WHO classification, be it in vulva or vagina, and correspondingly, the squamous carcinomas because they have prognostic implications, even if not therapy related implications. In cases of Paget's disease, it should be attempted to looking at uh, trying to differentiate whether it's primary or metastatic and to look for coexistent to carcinomas. Solid fibrous tumor is a ubiquitous tumor. Trust me, after this stat six, we've identified this tumor at locations like bone, uh, like I mentioned, in prostate, well, you know, hand. Uh, of course, it's a soft tissue tumor. And the female genital tract is one of these sites now. This tumor is being uncovered, which initially was called as maybe a spinal cell tumor, the difference that I just mentioned. Stat 6 is a good uh, or a magic marker for reinforcing your diagnosis. It's a diffuse nuclear expression that we will see in a SFT. So diagnosis of viewing sarcoma uh, at unused sites like female genital tract requires confirmation on molecular testing because it has significant treatment related implications. Patients will be induced on a specific aggressive chemotherapy protocol. And I say I share the that as if it's, it's an unknown journey. So we need to make sure that we are putting them on the high right track with the correct morphology IHCs. And that's the gold standard including molecular testing. Lymphoma again is a very, very important differential because it influences a completely different chemotherapy regime, including the various chemotherapies that are offered to different types of lymphomas and uh, not to miss out on melanoma the masquerader, because we might see this in terms of its completely uh, pigmentless form. But the good clues are that I utilize is uh, sudden nuclear pleomorphism, intranuclear inclusions, and IHCs are essential to reinforce or make this more objective diagnosis. Thank you very much for having me here to share my cases from which I learned. I'd be happy to take further questions. Yeah. Uh, so there are a few questions. One is, uh, is focal stat six staining with CD34 positivity enough to call a tumor as a... Uh, you know, yeah. So a have, right. That's a good question. I think that's a very practical question. So uh, we've, we've switched on from a polyclonal to a more monoclonal, uh, you know, uh, this thing, what shall I say, the, uh, the stat six clone that we're utilizing now. So if it's a, a, a solitary fibrous tumor, it, I would say 90% cases or more comes as a diffused nuclear expression. I have yet to see, you know, saying something as a focal, but yes, anything is possible. You make sure that is not the, uh, the what shall I say, cytoplasmic accentuation towards this marker that can happen. So that you need to disregard when you're thinking of an SFT. So there, if you are seeing a focal expression, CD34 patchy, that's the time I think you need to resort to molecular testing. That will be ideal. But I don't know in my experience looking at the SFTs, whenever you know, uh, the uh, CD34 can be patchy, rarely can be absent, but STAT6 really always helps, comes to a good, it's a good friend, you know, comes diffuse expression in most cases. But in IHCs, anything can happen. So if you are seeing an unusual pattern, I think that that's time molecular needs to step in. Yeah. Uh, one more question was for the small round cell tumors in a young patient, wouldn't you consider rhabdomyosarcoma also in the differential? Yes, we do, especially in pediatric or youngish patients. Uh, so Desmin is one of the states with which I start. Uh, you know, and we've seen cervical rhabdomyosarcoma uh, also. Uh, and uh, if if I'm seeing Desmin positivity, uh, you know, I might add on to myogenin and myotima. So that's a good uh add on towards uh, rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma in pediatric or young patients and uh, uh, you know rhabdomyoblastic differentiation in, in in 
tumors like the MMMTs, which you can see in endometrium or cervix. So if you have an older patient, uh, you're seeing an abdomenoplastic differentiation, don't restrict easily to calling it as an RMS. Make sure you're ruling out an MMMT because again, treatments can vary. We have a carcinoma based treatment for MMMT which might not respond towards an RMS that gets a specific chemotherapy. I would just add on, if you see matrix in a rhabdomyosarcomatous differentiation, including ERMS, we just had a nice talk today in our pediatric meeting with TMH. Dyson mutations are that this one needs to add on towards you know, this uh, gamut of rhabdomyoplastic differentiation. So I very well take your point of adding RMS as a differential round cell tumor. But I always, you know, I don't feel this uh, random IHC panel with, uh, you know, uh, with due respect to the panel followers. Uh, I always say it's kind of a morphology driven. So but even the realm of these round cell tumors, I call RMS as a, perhaps a large pink cell tumor. Uh, so, you know, unless you have an ARMS, which is spooky cut round cell. So if you have a uh, morphology that drives towards pink large cells, I would throw in a uh, a desmin, myo myogenin, and if it's a pediatric, I would do as a part of maybe a cattle. So have you tried the molecular testing in this vaginal and vulval adenocarcinoma? Vaginal and uh, the vulval. molecular testing. Molecular it's testing like uh, uh, for uh, for what? I mean, uh, in in adenocarcinomas, you're saying? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we haven't actually, we haven't had the, you see, a lot of these uh, molecular testing goes in two ways, either whether it's a pathology driven or it's a clinical need. I don't know if you're saying relating to HPV testing for molecular, is that if I get it correctly? No, sir, Are you just saying? like what we do in endometrial carcinomas. Okay, so you're saying the, uh, I see the molecular subtyping of the vulvar mm -hmm. or the vaginal, uh, vaginal endo, uh, adenocarcinomas. Uh, yeah, that's uh, so. I think uh, the way uh, molecular subtyping has come up in endometrial, you know, uh, in vulvar and vaginal locations, more like towards stratifying in two flavors of HPV positivity and HPV negativity, with the reasons I just mentioned. So, IHC is a good surrogate, but of course, not perfect. You can resort to it, techniques like ish towards seeing as, uh, you know, uh, what shall I say, HPV. Uh, positive. But again, if you have an adenocarcinoma, maybe of an interstitial type, you could go step ahead, perhaps for some KRAS mutations or, you know, additional mutations. Or if you have an endometrioid type of carcinoma, you can accordingly triage your cases for uh, further, uh, you know, uh, testing. If it's that simultaneous endometrial involvement, then you can go ahead with your uh, usual endometrial panel. But generally, uh, we don't have the requirement apart from this uh, uh, at the in terms of that. That's similar to what you see even in cervix. You know, IHC is good enough with uh, HPV and you can resort to your different combinations of uh, mucins and maybe other markers to differentiate in the single versus non -distil. I think that uh, that seems to be adequate in our experience. Okay. So one more last question. Adnexal neoplasms in the vulvovaginal areas, can it impose a diagnostic confusion? Yes, yes. it can. It, 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 it definitely can. Uh, adnexal tumors can impose. You, know, you have uh, a range of adnexal tumors I didn't include. Uh, so uh, you can have those as your differential adnexal tumors. Definitely can. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, off late, I can just uh, think about uh, myopathelial carcinomas and myopathelial like tumors that you see also in, uh, there's an excellent paper by one of my friends from uh, Japan, Aki goes, uh, spoken about this myopathelial like tumors, uh, you know, uh, in the, in the vaginal region, we've seen like an occasional case uh, of tumor like that. So you can have this uh, and it's a tumors, uh, maybe I can add on in subsequent sessions if we have that uh, at that time, uh, constraints if we don't have that. Okay, I think with that, we'll uh, end the session. So your potpourri of vaginal much. and vulval cases were actually a piece for us. A lot of interest from the common epithelial lesions to the very rare mesenchymal tumors. All It was a, a real piece for us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank Whatever you very you much. Can. And that's what actually drives my challenge towards delving into the, <laughs> the non-explored zones as a part of the soft tissue. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rajin, sir, for having me once again. Thank you for this event. Uh, thank you, sir, and thank you, ma'am. So we're going for the last session of the day. I welcome Dr. Sadi Pipi to introduce a speaker for this session. Madam was a former HOD 
of Pathology, Government Medical College, Calicut. Currently heading the Department of Pathology at KM City Medical College, Kodikot. Over to you, ma'am. Good evening. Am I audible? Yes, yes. <laughs> the yes. topic is uh, mesenchymal neoplasm. We know the spectrum of mesenchymal neoplasm in the uterus also has expanded in recent years, like any other cystic tumors or any other cystic tumors. Because of the advancement in the molecular techniques, it became possible to identify recurrent molecular alteration in different tumors so that a biology, more biologically and clinically significant classification has become possible. The aim of this molecular classification is not just an academic basis, but it also has a basis on which we develop the targeted therapy for each subcategory. Today, to talk about that, we have none other than Sandosh Menon, Professor of Pathology and Neuro-Oncology Disease Management Group Data Memorial Center. I feel really proud to introduce Dr. Sandosh Menon, our own student. Thank you, Rajin and uh, Dr. Gani, for giving uh, this opportunity. Sandosh belongs to the 38th batch of our Calicut Medical College. Very simple, humble, and sincere student and still maintaining this simplicity, even now being the Professor of Pathology and Euro-Oncology Disease Management Group of Tata, having an experience for more than 18 years. His uh, current interest, his areas of interest are oncopathology, mainly neuro-oncopathology and gynecology and immunodistic chemistry. To mention few of his achievements, he is in the editorial board of uh, WHO classification for male genital urinary tumors 2021 and uh, he is the secretary of uh, Society of Genital Urinary Pathologists in India, Urology Cancer Foundation, an external reviewer for ESDO on cervical cancer management as well as an external reviewer for the quality indicator of uh, cervical cancer registry, the reviewer of endometrial carcinoma surgery quality indicator and he is a nominated member for the Inter Urinary Pathology Society in USA. More than 75 publications in his credit. He is an ex sub editor of Indian uh, Journal of Cancer, reviewer of, reviewer of several international journals. Over to you, Sandosh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Sadi, madam, for that very, very kind introduction. And it's, it's, it's heartening to see you, even though it's virtual. Um, am I audible, uh, Dr. Ani? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's, it's great to see Dr. Uh, Rajan, sir, also. Hi, Rajan, sir. How are you? I hope uh, you're all doing very well. Yes. There, uh, uh, I would have loved to be uh, a part of a physical meeting so that I could have met you all physically. But then uh, the times are such that we still are meeting virtually. So hope to see you all soon sometimes. Uh, I would like to thank Rajan sir, Dr. Ani and the Kerala chapter for having me here. And the topic for, uh, for me today is on mesenchymal tumors and Sadi madam has already introduced uh, a lot of uh, things on that. Uh, let me see which is this. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes, visible. Yeah. Uh, so my topic for today is mesenchymal tumors of uterus. Uh, I've put in an uh, added statement that some of them are mundane, the routine leomyomas, which we call mundane. Some are controversial, some are old, and some are new. So we will go through this. Uh, the intent of this lecture is uh, to target PG students, uh, including second, third year PG students, uh, to most importantly make a diagnosis, reach a diagnosis. And then there are certain tumors which... Uh, like Sadi Madam has already said, you cannot do without molecular these days. And there is some little uh, initial initiation into, into molecular of these tumors. Uh, there are certain very rare tumors, which uh, none of us has uh, ever seen probably. And those certain pictures I have taken from uh, uh, a couple of journals like histopathology for completion sake. So with that, uh, I would just go on to the, the picture of this WHO female genital tumors. And if you look at the list of tumors, mesenchymal tumors, uh, we have the smooth muscle tumors and the endometrial stoma and related tumors. That's the basic category. And most common, if you look at smooth muscle, are the uterine and leomyomas. There is a category of intravenous leomyoma, which is self-explanatory. The controversial and difficult category of smooth muscle tumor of uncertain malignant potential, which is the stump. We have a very enigmatic category of metastasizing leomyoma. I've seen only one case of that. 
in in uh, up till now and then there are the dangerous and very very aggressive uterine leiomyosarcomas the endometrial stromal sarcomas we'll go on to later but basically they are divided into endometrial stromal nodules low grade and high grade and high grade again have different categories which are characterized by molecular statements now so this is again a blow up of the same to look at the same categories of uh, different classification of mesenchymal tumors of uh, uterus uh, if you look at the basic thing the benign or the uncertain mesenchymal tumors of uterus i've used uncertain because the stump is definitely uncertain category whereas the leiomyoma intravenous leiomyoma metastases are generally generally sort of uh, uh, put under the category of benign uh, mesenchymal tumors so i have lot of pictures it is basically intended to uh, for the pgs uh, the classical leiomyoma the mundane day to day routine we see several of them uh, they are very circumscribed tumors you have this pink looking tumor uh, it can be looking very blue uh, when it is cellular and that's when you call it cellular leiomyoma important thing is to look at them they are very circumscribed they generally do not invade the myometria and that's an important feature you need to pick up on on morphology again short and long, long fascicles bland looking spindle cells when you see such things under low power in the microscope you are almost definitely sure you're dealing with a my, uh, leiomyoma Uh, you may go to high power, and it should you should make it a habit to go to higher power to look at the mitotic activity. Sometimes these leiomyomas can have reproducing my, my, uh, mitosis at at places. Uh, uh, always, always remember that a grossing of such specimens is very important. All mesenchymal tumors, because most of the differential diagnosis and diagnosis borderline cases are decided based on necrosis and mitosis, which I'll be coming and alluding later on. And that's the basic understanding that whenever you see spindle tumor. before calling it a benign thing you have to look at a uh, higher power and look for mitotic activity uh, certain leiomyomas may have characteristic this staghorn kind of vessels and this nodular appearance with edematous areas uh, which are alveolar kind of edema you can say these are seen in uh, what is now uh, recognized as fh deficient uh, uh, leiomyomas or fumarate hydratase deficient leiomyomas and we need to keep an eye open although they form only 1% of leiomyomas uh, they may occur in a vast country in a big country like us we may come across these tumors and that needs to be taken into consideration uh, i have pulled out this list from the who book uh, these are the several leiomyomas which you may uh, diagnose but remember all of them are 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 benign leiomyomas so their behavior is benign and uh, you need to pick them up uh, generally when you are struggling with giving a name to this you open your who book and you put uh, put try try to put them into these categories uh, a couple of things uh, i just want to check is uh, apoplectic leiomyoma so some some tumors especially during uh, history of progesterone and uh, can have lot of areas of hemorrhage zonation phenomena they can have lot of fibrin and they may look like necrosis and this uh, may may be misdiagnosed sometimes as leiomyoma sarcoma and those so that needs to be kept in mind you need to get the history from the patient from the gynecologist whether the patient has treat, has been treated with uh, long standing progesterone and that can uh, cause this kind of infarction and zonation phenomena uh, 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 and and that should be picked up and not labeled as a uh, malignant tumor leiomyoma bizarre nuclei a dangerous looking tumor i'll show you some pictures but again if you stick to the basics of looking at mitosis and necrosis and only uh, the nuclei are bizarre that's when you diagnose what is took spoken about uh, cellular leiomyoma Uh, then there are the other categories of lipoleiomyoma mixoid leiomyoma and very rare cotyledonoid and diffuse the cotyledonoid uh, can be dissecting there can be small nodules of of leiomyoma which are going into the myometrium but they are very smooth in contour into and they look like little uh, kind of placenta kind of appearance of these leiomyomas uh, i have had the experience of seeing only one case of uh, this leiomyoma uh, this is a beautiful picture of a lipoleiomyoma you can see the fat within the these spindle cells they look beautiful there is some little mixoid change in the stroma but uh, uh, this is a, a beautiful looking tumor of a, of a lipoleiomyoma again pictures to show you lipoleiomyoma uh, this is what we were talking about bizarre looking leiomyoma you can see how the bizarrity can really stump you and cause problems so the 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 idea is these things are not uncommon when you look at an uh, underloper you are totally a uh, fox and you think that you're dealing with a high grade malignant tumor but again malignancy in 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 a smooth muscle tumor is based on on a constellation of features which we will come to uh, so, come to soon so like i said when you are dealing with the category of stump atypical leiomyoma bizarre leiomyoma the conundrum it's a big conundrum and we really get stumped uh, when we see this it is just like spotting a wildlife from a distance 
So you are standing at a distance. You are seeing a four-legged animal. You have to look whether it has got hooves, whether it has got horns, whether does does it have claws or paws, and does it have stripes? And if you can see the stripes, is it black and white or yellow? And then you can tell whether it is a zebra versus a tiger. So that's the understanding. You go step by step when you see a see a leiomyoma, when you see a spindle tumor, when you see a smooth muscle tumor. You go step by step. Don't miss out on it on anything. And this is one one paper written by my colleague Dr. Kedar Deodhar. uh in IJPM long back he studied 21 cases of stump and mind you these are really really gray zone in smooth muscle tumors and most of the cases uh, which we have come across in uh, in med- medical legal cases litigation belong to category of stump versus leiomyoma sarcoma so that's why i am again and again uh, reiterating the fact that it is extremely important to look at very very basic things like cellularity atp and pleomorphism mitosis atypical mitosis and coagulative tumor necrosis so i think this is the most important slide as far as the the whole presentation is concerned because these tumors are dicey stump versus leiomyoma sarcoma versus other categories of leiomyoma that's when you really can, can, can go wrong and make mistakes and land up in in medico legal issues you have to stick to the basics of looking at pleomorphism mitosis and obviously the coagulative tumor necrosis other important parameters are obviously the matrix or the background is it mixoid is it epithelioid or whatever it is and those are the criteria and stick to the strictly adhere to the mitotic count criteria uh coagulative tumor necrosis everybody sitting in the audience including the pgs and the senior pathologists will agree that coagulative tumor necrosis is a nightmare it's always difficult to to pick this up the best thing which we can do and understand is that it's an abrupt transition from viable cells to necrotic cells and that's when uh, with an interspose without an interspose uh, zone of granulation tissue so it's a very abrupt from viable to non viable that's when we uh, are looking at coagulative tumor necrosis there would be ghosts outlines of cells and even those ghost cells we can make out that they are very pleomorphic kind of cells and that's when we uh, really understand that this is and take it as coagulative tumor necrosis the other type of necrosis is the highly necrosis which we call or non coagulative type of necrosis it may sometimes show collagen not show that much collagen de- deposition and there may be some abrupt transition and that's when the dilemma and difficulties arise because this is a very very important criteria when we are looking at smooth muscle tumors uh, so picking up ct cn is of indi- and then there is the individual cell tumor necrosis sometimes which we see many people believe that this is an infarction type of necrosis but there are certain other people who say that whenever you see uh, see this kind of necrosis you should take more samples from the from the tumor so that you have adequately sampled and ruled out a ct cn in the individual so how do you uh, classify a stump i think uh, this is a old one uh, given by bell et al who said that it's not working so this uh, they may be atypical leiomyoma with low risk of recurrence atypical leiomyoma but with limited experience and then smooth muscle tumor of low malignant potential there are several names uh, to this kind of tumor which we say but remember most of the times these are the tumors which have bizarre nuclei but don't have the adequate amount of necrosis so this is again a picture of a stump which i taken from the article by dr dr kedar and this is showing you very very bizarre nuclei a little epithelial appearing cells but again these does not have mitosis the necrosis may be single cell but not the typical uh, ctcn which you see so this is the who criteria of uh, diagnosing uterine smooth muscle uh, tumors of uncertain malignant potential first and foremost you look at the necrosis whether it is absent or present if necrosis is present then there should definitely not not be any atp and the mitosis should be very less so that's when you call it stump and if the mitosis in if the if the necrosis is absent then that there is a there is a provision that there may be a moderate to severe atp but again the mitotic rate is generally considered to be less in this so there this table whenever you are in doubt please open the book again go to go through this because this is difficult to memorize and difficult to find and now the who has in, in, improved in, included the criteria of per millimeter square uh, uh, instead of uh, mitosis per 10 hepafield uh, that has in, in, that has caused even more problems uh, uh, people have to relearn things and people have to standardize this across the board and that's going to add a little but then that is an aim to uh, have a standardized criteria of mitotic activity throughout uh, the whole of the who so this is a classical picture to show ctcn you have tumor cells which are perivascularly preserved here and then you have necrosis which is very very abrupt at this this junction between the tumor and the so this is what is called as uh, coagulative tumor cell necrosis very abrupt transition from uh, a perithelial uh, preserved tumor to a completely necrotic area and then you may see a lot of debris along this tumor also 
again a higher power to show how the uh, the viable tumor is suddenly uh, getting uh, uh, into a necrotic area and that that is important in contrast this is a more highly nice kind of area you have a gradual transition you have some very uh, preserved nuclei in between and there is highly nice areas so this is not to be called as a uh, coagulative tumor necrosis sometimes when the patient has been given progestrons you can have myxoid looking uh, necrosis sometimes the patient has a large fibroid uh, there is gel, uh, gel embolization so this is a picture of a gel which is gel embolized uh, tumor completely showing necrotic areas and you should have this histine with you when you are looking at lymphomas with this kind of necrosis so it's important to know the backgrounds about about these patients so the lymphomas are are benign but then you have watershed areas when you see atypia when you see more mitotically active areas you have to take more sections and we have to all all think about and look at the basics of mitosis necrosis and atypia and based on that we have to put the patient uh, categorize the patient either as a lia, lia, category of some lymphoma or a, a stump or then call it a lymphoma sarcoma coming to uterine sarcomas uh, they are rare tumors again and they are a heterogeneous group of mesenchymal tumors uterus is the most common primary site and the less common sites uh, some of them bharat has already alluded to uh, are the vulva and vagina Uh, what are the different kinds of uterine sarcomas? The most one are primary ones are the leiomyosarcoma, sarcoma, endometrial stroma sarcoma, and the adenosarcoma. Rest are the sarcomas which can occur very rarely in the uterus are rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, Ewing's, and synovial sarcomas, which we see rarely in the uh, uterine tract. Uh, before we go into the actual diagnosis of this, I just want to elude that the figure staging of sarcoma is a little different from the endometrial uh, cancers, and it is basically based on the size of the tumor in the stage one A one B. and we have to accurately measure the tumor size if we have a resected specimen of a sarcoma uh, because based on the 5 cm cut off their uh, stage into 1a and 1b uh, for the other types of sarcomas like uh, like your I mean, mpnsts and rhabdomyosarcomas sarcomas now you have the fnc lcc grading system which is used similar to what we used in the soft tissue sarcomas so what is uterine lms it's a malignant neoplasm of pure smooth muscle differentiation it is the most common uterine sarcoma and it typically occurs in postmenopausal women uh, this is again from the who criteria you have a conventional uterine leiomyosarcoma you have a epithelioid leiomyosarcoma and a myxoid leiomyosarcoma uh, it is again difficult to uh, learn this by heart whenever you are encounter uh, a possibility of leiomyosarcoma please open your book please look at the atypia please look at the necrosis and please look at the mitotic activity and based on this criteria and mind you mitotic activity is something which is very very uh, uh, subjective again sometimes uh, the uh, there is lot of uh, difficulty in uh, labeling what is mitosis and it is a good practice to show your colleagues to show your friends and uh, show your fellow mates uh, whether they agree with this is a mitotic count and have a cross count with people because this is a area where where uh, mistakes occur in in this the, uh, this situation uh, so these are the criteria uh, again coming back to the very important thing to diagnose leiomyosarcoma sarcoma again you fall back onto the very very basic which is atypia mitosis and coagulative tumor necrosis so some pictures to show so this is a photograph a micro photograph to show that this is mitosis probably this is mitosis but then there are certain things you are not sure of this one you are not sure of what is happening here and that is one the problem occurs uh, if i show it to first year jr this figure they will count maybe 20 mitosis in this so uh, mitosis in a smooth muscle tumor uh, is a, is a problem there is lot of degenerative changes uh, leiomyomas leiomyosarcoma smooth muscle tumors are hormonally responsive tumors they are in various stages of activity in their and the nucleus may look from very very crisp to very very degenerate kind of appearance and that's very important uh, not to call and label a degenerating nuclei degenerated nuclei uh, as a mitotic activity and that needs to be carefully picked up again to show uh, pictures uh, of what may be called as mitosis probably this one uh, not sure of this one but then there are other smudgy kind of nuclei here and here and here which some may call it mitotic activity and in inexperienced i would call it mitosis so it's important to pick up basic mitosis mitotic activity again picture to show a very strange looking mitosis here but again you have some degeneration here some degeneration here some degeneration here which you are not sure and should not be labeled so you have to take take up and count the typical mitotic activity again pictures to show that pictures to show a typical coagulative tumor necrosis abrupt transition from a spindle tumor uh, viable to a non viable area completely necrotic 
uh, in comparison this is a more highly nice highly in kind of an area which should not be called not to be no, no necrosis not necrosis so and that's important it's a very highly nice uh, area and not to be labeled as a Uh, problem comes in this uh, when we have limited sections and we have this kind of necrosis and we are not sure whether some procedure has been done previously to the patient like a like a embolization and all then we really start struggling with this although we can see the outlines and silhouettes of these and this is when we uh, try to say that this uh, this uh, necrosis is not sure it is indeterminate and if it is accompanied by a, a bizarre looking uh, smooth muscle tumor we would probably label this as a stump and put the patient on close follow up so some more pictures pink looking tumors blue looking tumors uh, variable mitotic activity you have to look at various fields and go according to count sometimes these even at low power there may be some very apoptotic looking cells and you may label them as mitosis uh, you have to go to high power to count the mitosis and not at low power so very very bizarre looking uh, leomy sarcoma uh, again looking at areas you can have very bland looking cells in between very very pleomorphic looking uh, cells in this tumor again single cell necrosis merging onto areas of typical necrosis with lot of tumor debris and this would be counted as ctcn again pictures to show what a typical coagulative tumor necrosis looks like and this is how you should uh, label this tumor uh, as possibly a leomy sarcoma based on the atp and the presence of necrosis in in contrast this is what a highly in kind of an area looks like or highly necrosis looks like a very important feature which many of us don't Uh, uh is is an infiltrative border a tumor which is infiltrating the myometrium showing lot of bizarre nuclei and mitosis uh, is a with smooth muscle tumor marker positive has to be labeled as a leomy sarcoma so this infiltrative border borders and destruction of the myometrium is an important criteria to to label anything as malignant whether it's a mixoid leomy sarcoma or a, or a typical conventional leomy sarcoma so you have to take sections of the tumor with the adjacent myometrium and that's important Uh, unfortunately the problem in leo diagnosis of leomy sarcoma is always that these tumors pre operative radiology are called as fibroids and they are morcellated some of them they are not morcellated in a bag and that's when the problem starts uh, that is spill over into the peritoneum and that's when the patient has to bear the consequences of this uh, thankfully most of the gynecologists laparoscopically are now using morcellator with a bag and they morcellate the tumor in a bag so their sp chances of spillage are uh, less in this tumor this is a desmin positive this is caldesmon which are typically seen in this p16 is a good marker uh, uh, a good a good 60 70% of leomy sarcomas would be positive nicely for p16 uh, diffuse nuclear and cytoplasmic positivity and we do routinely employ this uh, when we are dealing with leomy sarcomas uh, that was conventional when you have more epithelioid rounded and polygonal cells uh, pink looking cytoplasm you have to think of epithelioid leomy sarcomas the criteria are different go back to the criteria look at it look at the mitotic rate of 4 per 10 hyperfields count it and then uh, you have a diagnosis of uh, epithelioid leomy sarcoma higher power to show the same again epithelioid looking cells uh, a caveat here is whenever you look at see epithelioid looking uh, say leomy sarcoma query query leomy sarcoma always think of a picoma also because picoma can have this morphology uh, and you have to employ in your panel uh, in addition to the smooth muscle markers you have to employ uh, hmb45 to to pick picoma diagnosis of picoma a more epithelioid looking leomy sarcoma with lot of atp a little mixoid background and this is a mixoid leomy sarcoma generally it's not so cellular it is less cellular but then there may be some cellular areas uh, some areas which may be typical of a conventional uh, leomy sarcoma but uh, the predominant has to be a mixoid to call it a mixoid like a general conventional leomy sarcoma may also have mixoid areas and then it should not be called as a mixoid a leomy sarcoma more epithelioid admix with little mixoid areas infiltrating the myometrium uh, in this picture a uh, <clears throat> word about molecular pathology it is not come into routine practice in in uh, leomy sarcoma but i think the important markers are tp53 and med12 which can be seen in substantial percentage of uh, leomy sarcomas uh, currently targetable treatment in leomy sarcomas are not that uh, advanced and it is a general chemotherapy which is given these to these patients and most of these patients have a very poor outcome even if they are early stage tumors they would uh, the risk of recurrence is very very high in, in, in leomy sarcomas most of the times they present with metastases in a country like ours they are late presentations are seen coming quickly to other sarcomas like adenosarcomas 
uh, like the name says the the sarc the the tumor is basically a low grade to high grade sarcoma which is intimately admixed with benign glandular epithelium and here i would like to show a a a, a paper by by dr bharat uh, who published this in uh, in igpm again 19 adenosarcomas and he had a spec he showed a spectrum of this with low grade this kind of phylloid kind of appearance uh, which you can see in adenosarcomas with low grade component but then there are high grade components uh, of the sarcoma but the glands remain benign and the gland look benign and they are part of the tumor they part and parcel of the tumor uh, but these are again very very rare tumors and uh, we we get to see them very rarely uh, coming to the newer categories of uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma the classification of endometrial stromal sarcoma uh, do i stop here for a minute dr rajan uh, rajan sir and uh, sadhi madam any questions on this before i move ahead hello rajan sir any uh, sadhi madam any questions yeah, anybody yeah, let me see is there any cut off for using pip index in differentiating leiomyoma and leiomyosarcoma no madam i uh, had life would have been easy if you had cut off for case which is life would have been easy and not only in in gynae but in across the board in pathology there yeah. were bit cut offs so but yeah uh, a leiomyosarcoma would not have a low pip index that's for sure uh so unfortunately the low definition of low is different in, uh, for different people what is your experience with p16 in leiomyosarcoma always be positive uh not always ma'am but a good 60 70% would be positive uh, in these okay. we do what we just progesterone yes so er and pr are usually done we do it about 40 50% would be er positive in these and uh, that is important because especially in a metastatic setting of leiomyosarcomas they when they are uh, they don't have any option of any other chemotherapy they would put the, these on on uh, anti estrogens these patients no pre operative progesterone sometimes they give no so what is uh, the effect of the histamine pre operative progesterone for leiomyosarcoma the problem with leiomyosarcoma is even leiomyoma leiomyoma yes yes, yes. Yeah, yeah 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 so that's what causes lot of issues madam it causes necrosis yeah. it causes yeah. apop apoplectic changes and that needs to be kept in mind so whenever yeah, yeah. we have a typical leiomyoma but showing strange areas like hemorrhage and fibrin and that kind of necrosis we uh, do ask uh, the we although we don't get typically leiomyomas in our practice because we are a pure cancer center but we do sometimes it does uh, land up our table and we ask for history of whether preoperatively progesterone was given to the gnrh and all those were given to the patient now it is it's a real problem sometimes yes class, yes ma'am even in the patient we exactly. have Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay, now we proceed. Okay, sure. Uh, so, coming to endometrial stromal sarcomas, uh, the classification is again endometrial stromal nodule, which is extremely rare. I'll not be going into that in detail. The commonest one is the low-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma, a very very enchanting tumor again. And then we have the high-grade endometrial stromal sarcoma, which are the YWHA and the BCOR rearranged ones. so this is the uh, latest who and this has been recognized as separate entities and uh, we have to use a extended panel of immunohistochemistry as well as molecular to uh, categorically diagnose these two categories uh, coming to low grade endometrial stromal sarcomas they are very uh, indolent tumors they have a favorable prognosis uh, they the, the issue with them is they are characterized by very late recurrences i'm sure anybody who's practiced long enough in pathology Uh, would have seen uh, low grade ESS recurring after fifteen years, eighteen years, twenty years. So that's a very strange kind of a, a tumor which which can have very late occurrences and thus it has the patient has to be under a long term follow up. The five year survival is good and 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 uh, even even in in a metastatic setting when it comes back they are generally generally hormonally manipulated drugs, uh, manipulable drugs and that's that's an important part of uh, low grade ESS. Uh, the classic classic feature is this tongue like infiltration into myometrium. we this very classical arteriolar arterioles uh, which are seen in this tumor very uniformly distributed arterioles generally in a classical case and this tongue like projections into the my myometrium uh, uh, called as permeation of the myometrium the correct term to use is permeation of the myometrium and that's how they look like uh, this is an old picture uh, showing a very blue looking tumor invading the uh, uh, permeating the myometrium again the very classical uh, picture of uh, arterioles which are interspersed throughout this blue looking tumor so the the cells look like endometrial stroma and the, but then it's a complete tumor complete all areas are full of these blue looking tumor with interspersed arterioles the interface of the tumor with the myometrium is permeative tongue like 
and that's a characteristic feature of these uh, low grade endometrial stoma sarcoma they invariably have uh, lymphovascular emboli again throughout the myometrium in in the in the vessels in the lymph nodes you can have metastasis and this is how they look uh, in this they can take up the shape of the vessel a beautiful uh, uh, emboli of this uh, low grade endometrial stoma sarcoma which is seen in the myometrium they can have different morphologies they can be less blue looking have more prominent vessels they can have less prominent vessels with more blue looking areas where a differential you should entertain is of a high grade ess because a high grade ess can have a a a, a bi bi biphasic or biphasic areas of low grade looking areas and a high grade looking areas so that's important uh, then you have a pink looking tumor with again that vascularity is still there and then there you have pseudo papillary kind of or pseudo uh, cystic in there, there there may be cystic spaces with this projections which can occur in this uh, tumor throughout sometimes there may be smooth muscle stoma which may look hyalinized within them and then there is a smooth muscle differentiation which is characteristically seen as a starburst phenomena within this endometrial stomal tumor and those are the different kind of variations which you can have this was in a very old study we did study uh, 84 cases uh, of uh, low grade ess and we found that uh, uterus is the most common site although it can occur anywhere if, uh, ranging from cervix to ovary uh, in this tumor Uh, the, the important point about uh, low grade ess another thing is the morphology is generally preserved you don't have too much uh, variability in 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 the classical morphology so uh, we did a thesis of uh, 70 75 cases later on uh, recently and out of that 75 cases 72 had a very classical morphology of ess and only in three cases we had a little sex cord like areas and all that stuff which is not very common and i'm not uh, touching upon them that's why uh i'll take this high grade ess as a case uh, probably uh, this is a 37 year old female who presented with menorrhagia uh, mri showed a polyp with adenomyosis and then she had lot of deposits throughout the peritoneum and head neck say and hepatic and all that so this was how she was she presented uh, then we uh, have this microscopic picture this was slides which were sent from outside as referral you can see this again tongue like projections which are going into myometrium which made us think that this is probably a strange looking ess a little uh, bluish mixoid looking uh, tumor which is going into the myometrium higher power to show that these are bland looking spindle cells more or less pretty much monomorphic very less pleomorphism but the background matrix is a little mixoid in nature there was mitotic activity uh, not rip roaring but uh, uh, frequent mitosis was seen and then there were very few areas of necrosis which was characteristically seen in this tumor uh this is a tumor which was strongly diffusely positive for bcor and cyclin d1 uh and we did think of uh, of a bcor uh, uh, rearranged tumor and that brings us to this table that whenever you are dealing with endometrial stomal tumors uh especially the ywha tumors and the bcor tumors you have to do this battery of test cd10 is a good marker for low grade endometrial stomal sarcoma it can come across all high grades also positive uh erpr is generally strongly positive in low grade ess uh can be variable in 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 both uh, ywha as well as bcor uh, mutated uh, high grade ess important markers to pick up high grade are cyclin d1 and bcor so if these two markers are positive we are most likely dealing with a high grade endometrial stomal sarcoma and the confirmation does require a molecular testing uh, for fish for ywha uh, rearrangement or a bcor uh, sequencing which is done for these patients uh, so this is again a paper from from uh, modern pathology uh, long back in 2018 uh, about 17 cases of a new variant uh, new new high grade endometrial stoma stoma sarcoma the z z c3 h7 b b core high grade endometrial stoma sarcomas these are uh, again these can be very very mixoid in nature so uh, the idea is how do you pick these uh, high grade endometrial these are generally mixoid and your differential is a is a mixoid leiomyosarcoma but then they they are more cellular compared to a mixoid leiomyosarcoma and that's when you would like want to do a bcor and a cyclin d1 uh, uh, to pick these up there is positive staining for cyclin d1 cd10 and uh, bcor may be positive in 80% again you have to confirm them with molecular testing these are of two types one is the, uh, the fused one and the one the other one is the bcor internal tandem duplication we are currently not doing these tests in our department but couple of patients have gone outside and get got this done from uh, various different other molecular labs outside so coming to the other high grade endometrial stomal sarcoma this was one of the first papers on ywha uh, endometrial stomal sarcomas they are again supposedly uh, 
high grade uh, in their nature and they are characterized by the presence of this fusion YWCA nut M2A uh, fusion, uh, which is characterized characteristic of this. Again, the IHC profile is of cyclin D1 positivity. Mind you, they can be positive for CKIT and CD56, and that needs to be kept in mind that these tumors have got a variable profile of IHC. Uh, classically described, this is one of our own cases, uh, shows this kind of a strange pattern, which you may probably think is like a low grade. In, in the sense, they, they've got bland areas like this, uh, spindle and interspersed areas of, of this more uh, pink areas. And then there is sudden abrupt transition to a, a, a round cell tumor like areas with edematous area. So that's the classical combination picture of what you see in a YWHA uh, translocate, trans, translocated uh, uh, high grade ESS. They can have a variable mitosis, but they are generally diffusely and strongly positive for cyclin D1. Mind you, they can be positive for BCOR also. And that's why any tumor which is BCOR and cyclin D1 positive has to go for a fish for YWHA. And if it's YWHA re rearranged, then you call it a YWHA rearranged uh, high grade ESS. Again, you can see that the low grade areas may not show that strong positivity compared to the round cell looking areas in the high grade ESS, which is strongly and diffusely positive for cyclin D1. And that's the catch. And that's how you uh, probably start picking up these tumors. We did a fish for this, and it was very uh, nicely and clearly showing translocation of the YWHA uh, tumor. Another YWHA translocated tumor, very blue looking tumor. And these sudden areas of necrosis are pretty characteristic of this tumor. Again, a blue looking tumor in this case. Uh, round cell areas, thin thin vessels around them. Uh, some some may all even think start thinking of Ewing sarcoma. Uh, but then generally the the look is of an endometrial stomal kind of a appearance. And then you have mitosis, you have cyclin D positive and B core positive. And that's when you think and make a diagnosis of high grade ESS and ask for molecular testing. A strain tumor which we came across, uh, a rare tumor in the uterus, again which can be confused with high grade sarcomas is an inflammatory myofibrillastic tumor. You can see the myxoid and the very tissue culture-like appearance of these spindle cells, uh, which are following each other like a shoal of fish uh, appearance. And that's a very characteristic. You can see that the inflammatory cells are interspersed throughout this. This was Desmin positive, SMA. ALK was uh, positive and we confirmed it with fish calc. Uh, that finishes a lot of category of endometrial sarcoma. The whatever is left, is dumped into an undifferentiated endometrial sarcoma when we are not able to characterize the tumor, we are not able to fit. Uh, thankfully, this category of undifferentiated endometrial uh, sarcomas uh, is diminishing because many of them uh, with the translocation studies are either categorized as high grade ESS, B core type or the YWHA type. And then we have other categories which are coming up. So some other newly described sarcomas, uh, I'll just take up a case. This was again a lady who was referred from Delhi, 62 year old lady. Uh, again, presented with a large tumor in the fundus of the uterus with multiple enlarged lymph nodes in the aortocoval and parietic region. She underwent uh, exploratory rapidotomy and THBSO, and we got three blocks uh, referred from, from Delhi. And this was how the tumor, it was almost completely destroying the whole of the myometrium. It was a large tumor with nodal metastasis. And this is the picture. It looks blue under the microscope. And even at this power, you can see areas of the small, small areas of necrosis and breakdown. And then there were again large areas of geographic necrosis in this tumor, uh, blue looking tumor. Uh, again, you can see that they, they, they are uh, sort of small nest, very thin capillary kind of things, very prominent nucleoli, even at this power you can make out, but otherwise they look pretty monomorphic. They don't have that pleomorphism of the nucleus, uh, no size shape variation. Uh, very again, this appearance and some breakdown in between the stroma is there. At this power, probably you can appreciate they have a little rhabdoid morphology in these tumor cells, uh, more higher power to show clearly that many of them have got eccentrically placed nuclei and a pink rhabdoid looking uh, cytoplasm, which is very characteristically seen in this picture uh, uh, across the board. And then there is areas of necrosis. There were some areas of myxoid. So we wondered what kind of tumor is this? Uh, higher power to show the very, very prominent nucleoli and the cytoplasm of these cells. Uh, the differential diagnosis we entertained were endometrial stomal sarcoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma was a possibility. Some people even th thought of myeloid tumors in this. Then there was undifferentiated uterine sarcoma and undifferentiated carcinoma, which we thought of. These are the IHCs. A1, A3 was negative. Cyclin D1 was rather strongly positive. So we thought we are dealing with an endometrial stomal sarcoma in this. SMA was focally, this is a fo picture from a focal area, which is for positive. CD10, very focally positive. 
INA1 was retained in this tumor very nicely. Desmin, HMB45, CD30, MUM1. So these were different. This, this went across uh, the board of different uh, disease management groups from gynae to lymphomas to everybody saw this case because it was a dicey case. And finally, we landed up on this. Uh, we did a BRG1 or SMAR K4 and we can see that the tumor cells are dead negative. So there is loss of BRG1, loss of SMAR K4 and that's how you uh, arrive at a diagnosis of uh, SMAR K4 deficient uh, 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 endometrial stromal sarcoma. These are extremely, extremely rare tumors. This patient was affording. They went for next generation sequencing and uh, find, found that the, there was loss of SMAR K4. Uh, these are newer tumors. And the more and more we pick up these tumors, the less the end undifferentiated category is going to be. So the undifferentiated category is going to diminish as more and more molecular tumors are more and more molecular uh, uh, defined tumors are described in, in, in this category of tumors. This is the case which we happened to publish. This is uh, the first case from India, which we published. Uh, this patient was given pazopenib, but unfortunately the patient died within six months. She had an initial good response to, to pazopenib, but uh, finally she succumbed to her disease. Uh, I think I'll skip these ones. Uh, quickly going into the last uterine tumor, probably. This is a 20 year old female. I think I've shown it in one of my slide seminars. This was a large mass uh, patient referred from Calcutta uh, with uh, large mass in the abdomen, bilateral ovaries not seen separately. Uh, because she was 20 years, they did an AFP because it's important to rule out a germ cell tumor. They did LDH and they did all these markers. And because the LDH was raised, the uh, possibility of dysgerminum was entertained. She was given three cycles of BEP. Somebody saw it again. They called it a lymphoma and was given one cycle of job. So uh, this is the uh, problem and issues which we face in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, uh, somebody just based on the markers, uh, without a diagnosis, tissue diagnosis, started treating and gave the patient treatment of germ cell tumor. Uh, when the patient came to us, uh, uh, we saw this core biopsy from the, from the <clears throat> tumor. It's a long core, almost resemble prostate cores. A lot of uh, smooth muscle bundles here. But then there is something different looking area here. So this is how the lesion looked, looked very foamy. There was a lot of pigment in this uh, area because the patient had given, been given chemotherapy. We thought it's all that. Again, very, very bland, monomorphic looking cells, different from the smooth muscle bundles, probably of the myometrium. I think you can see the wispy looking uh, cytoplasm, eosinophilic cytoplasm. Some of them have got clear cells. Again, very bland. The nuclei look pretty bland, pretty monomorphic throughout the lesion. And some areas had very, very clear kind of appearance. And if you can appreciate there is slight pigment, we thought it was all hemosiderin, uh, possibly because of the chemotherapy patient has received. More areas to show you <clears throat> pigment. And this is a stain. So this came as HMB45 positive, strongly and diffusely. You can see that how it is nicely positive in the cells. Desmin was negative. The normal myometrium uh, or the smooth muscle bundles are positive. Desmin negative. The tumor or the lesion is negative. Uh, this is another stain which we did. This is TFE3, which is strongly positive uh, in this tumor cells. Very, very dark. It's almost looking black. So strongly and diffusely positive. Ascended was negative. So this is, uh, this is again a mesenchymal tumor of uterus. It's a malignant picoma, uh, which is TFE3 positive. Uh, a quickly, a quick wrap up of this. Uh, these are again challenging cases, which we come across rarely in, in the uterine tract. Uh, they have been described and the female genital tract accounts for nearly 25% of picoma solved body. But again, if you look at it, the, uh, the commonest site of picoma in the gynae tract is the uterine body. Uh, the importance is that the TFE gene rearranged picomas uh, are targeted differently. Uh, there are certain other targets like uh, chrysotinib, which can be tested in these tumors. Um, I don't want to go into the details of this. I think I'll skip this. The issue is that in this case, we had a very foamy and clear appearance and we thought it was all histocytic cells post chemotherapy, but we need to keep in mind that it's a large tumor, uh, a misdiagnosed tumor previously. And, and we have to judicially, judicially use the IHCs to arrive at such diagnosis. Uh, I think I will stop Sati Madam here. Maybe I think it's too late to continue this because the rest is all some new terminologies which people need to be aware of like NTRK fusion cervical sarcomas which are there. And these are pictures from the WHO which I've taken and some, some uh, other tumors which are coming up. These are purely molecularly defined tumors. 
and uh, without doing molecular we cannot uh, categorically diagnose these tumors like ntrk tumors and col1 a1 tumors uh, which are fibrosarcoma like tumors uh, the rare utero sac tumors which have uh, which resemble sex cord tumors in the uh, uterus and uh, i think i'll just skip this uh, to summarize basically uh, if you look at sarcomas lyoma sarcoma is the commonest i think we stick to the basics uh, sadhi madam you'll agree with me the pgs yes. need to understand that ATP, yeah, yeah. mitotic count, and CTN. I think this is the most important thing. And mind you, this is uh, one of the commonest cause of litigation which I've seen in gynae practice: uh, stump versus lyomyoma versus uh, lyomyoma sarcoma. Uh, Low-grade endometrial stroma sarcoma, very characteristic histology, hormonally amenable sarcoma. High-grade sarcomas are now of two types: the YWH mutated and the BCOR rearranged. And now the undifferentiated sarcomas will continue to shrink as more entities like SMARK-A4 deficient sarcomas are described. And some of the sarcomas may have targetable therapies in future. We still don't have many targetable therapies, but I'm sure in the next decade, this is going to be a big boom in, in the treatment of uh, uterine sarcomas. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, Dr. Bharat and Dr. Kedar. My guiding clinical colleagues, uh, you learn a lot from clinical colleagues. They push you to do better. Uh, come out with new tests and new things and obviously uh, i want to thank my residents and patients thank you so much thank you santosh for beautifully illustrating the real challenges in the smoke muscle tumors if you more question will take bonus uh, what is your experience with p53 in lyomyo sarcoma uh we generally don't do p53 in all lyomyo sarcomas if it's a straight forward lyomyo sarcoma we would not do a p53 in such tumors but then we are if it really at crossroads sometimes uh, of of uh, diagnosing uh, p53 uh, lyomyo sarcomas doing p53 probably probably would would take us towards a lyomyo sarcoma because it's a mutated tumor but generally my experience with doing p53 on non lyomyo sarcoma is very limited we don't do it on on, on lyomyo sarcomas Have you got a combination of endometrial stromal sarcoma and leiomyoma sarcoma? Uh, ah, um, no, madam. I don't remember coming across such a case. Seriously. Okay. Another question is: How well should we sample when we get a laparoscopic myometomy specimen? How many bits should we sample? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Man. How well should we sample when we get a laparoscopic myometomy specimen? Uh, so we are talking about morselated specimen. I think that's mm. what we are saying. So that's what I said. The issue of morselation was a big problem about a decade back when people, uh, the gynecologists, were morselating and there was spillage into the abdominal cavity. And later on, it was picked up as a lyomyoma sarcoma or an endometrial stromal sarcoma. Uh, these days, they put the tumor in the bag and they morselate within the bag in most of the cases. And that is an important point. Uh, It's a difficult question to answer in the sense that how many sections do you take from a typical lyomyoma? So you have taken five, seven sections. It looks like a very classical lyomyoma. Do you go and submit the entire morselated specimen? The answer is no. You don't submit the entire morselated specimen. Lyomyoma with bland morphology, having irregular margin, what should we call it? <sighs> <laughs> difficult question, ma'am. I was expecting all such questions. uh lyomyoma classical with a little undulating margins i would not put it into anything i would call it still call it a lyomyoma if it is well in, inside the uterus yes and there is yeah. okay what is p16 positive like non-gynec lms uh yeah i think so many of the lms of non-gynec are also p16 positive it is nothing to do with hpv actually if hemorrhage and infarction are seen in lyomyoma In the absence of history of progesterone therapy, call it stump. Ah, uh, we have to be sure that uh, the the necrosis is at least a CTCN. So that is the importance of picking up CTCN. If you have a lyomyoma with CTCN, you would probably uh, take more sections. Take more sections to ascertain. uh the type of necrosis you take more sections to look at if there are areas of which are frankly atypical and that's when when you really look and you have to be careful in such cases the idea of uh, making this present in is there's no single answer the answer is stick to the basics stick to the basics of taking more sections stick stick to the basics of counting the mitosis or stick to the basics of looking at picking up the micro necrosis if you are not sure we i to definitely discuss it with bharat and kedar sir 
always when I'm suspecting that this is a borderline tumor because the treatment, the prognosis is so, so different between a, between a leomyosarcoma. Leomyosarcoma sarcomas are one of the worst tumors uh, in the human body. Nowadays, we see many large inhibitory polyp, 80 to 10 centimeter in size, most perposal patients with benign looking glands embedded in adventifibrous stroma. Since WHO has removed adventifibroma entity, now what will be labeled this as? I think we'll have to ask WHO only that. <laughs> so basically, we are talking of something benign entity. We are talking of benign. Yeah. Entity. Yeah. Adenomyoma is there, but. Yeah. Adenomyoma is there, ma'am. Adenomyoma. Uh, yeah. We still, still call atypical polypartial adenomyomas. They are very well known yeah. and they are known to involve the myometrium a little bit. Um, and, have you seen epithelial fibrosarcoma in female guilty? Oh, uh, no. I haven't seen. Maybe Bharat has seen epithelial fibrosarcoma. Senile endometrial stoma oh. has fibrosarcoma. Yeah, Bharat, you want to add something? Yeah. No, no, I just said I haven't seen epithelioid fibrosarcoma. Is it madam sclerosing epithelioid fibrosarcoma in the female genital tract? I haven't seen either. Then, yeah, that's all. The endometrial stromal sarcoma case is shown with uh, rhabdoid morphology similar to this. I recently got one. Okay. Yeah, it must be smart A4. You should get a BRG one done in BRG one done. Any more question? Anything I left, Ani? You are muted. Rajin, sir, any questions? Ani is muted. Oh, sorry, there is one uh, senile endometrial stroma with hyperchromatic cells, compactly arranged but without mitosis. Is it normal histology? I don't know the answer to this. Senile endometrial stroma, I don't think I have ever called something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Annie, the thing is, uh, when we are encountering difficult lesions, the basic idea to convey to the clinician is benign versus malignant. That's a very extremely important for them. And if you're not able to, uh, struggling with lesions, we are doing several ICs, reaching nowhere, we at least try to tell them what kind of malignancy it is likely and what grade of the malignancy is likely. That's that's important for practice. You get CD10 positivity even in Leomyoma, Yes, yes, yes. CD10 is somehow losing its uh, its credibility. Mm. A lot of, it comes in so many tumors. What about Desmin and uh, endometrial stroma? Endometrial stroma sarcoma generally would not be positive, but focally these all can come here and there. All, mm. all SMA and positivity is very, SMA. very, very, very well known in endometrial stroma. Do you think it's more specific? Caldesoma or? Uh... Caldesoma is specific. Smooth muscle marker, caldesoma is specific. So, we'll so, uh, so if we have any doubt, it's better to do a caldesoma or SMA or should we do both? Uh, generally, if you are not uh, resource constrained, you would like to do both in that setting. Okay. Sir. Uh, so one basic doubt, um, if we have multiple leomyomas in a uterus, you will have a classical type, then you might even have a lipo leomyoma type. How do you like uh, name it in a report? I would put everything as benign. That's first important thing. Just most important so. thing is. So we can give all kinds of descriptions. Uh, for our fun and but the clinician is going to ask you only one question is there anything which is atypical there? Okay, sir. Or it's atypical. We'll thank you, Sandosh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandosh. Thank you. Rajan, sir, thank you so much. It's so good to see you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hope to see you all soon. Yeah, Sometimes. sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sadi, madam. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Indu. Dr. Indu is here, I think. Yeah, Dr. Indu, I have not seen her yet. I mean, she has her camera is off. Uh, Indu was here. Uh, okay. She's here, I think. Hi, hi. Hi, hi, hi Dr. Hello, hi, hi. I haven't seen you. You are the main organizer. And, and <laughs> so thank you for kindly inviting me. Thank you. I was just coordinating. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Preeti also here. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Preeti is also here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good night and a happy weekend and a 75th uh, Freedom. Uh, yeah. Independence Day. Uh, have, have a long weekend. Thank you. It's Dr. Preeti. Thanks, Dr. Indu. Yeah. Very nice meeting everybody. Thank you. Thank Same you. Here. Thank you, Bharat. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bharat, for sticking and.
Yeah. Pitching in, <laughs> pitching in amazing game and teamers that this is your fault. I just can't resist that, you know. And <laughs> and thanks to Dr. Nambiar also. Dr. Nambiar is there. I can Dr. see Nambiar Dr. Nambiar Mathur there. also. Achha, it's yeah. wonderful to see everybody. Very good. All the virtual. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Bharat sir, for answering most of the questions in the QA section. Yes, I like that. So I was just I. You know, Santosh, you were asking for questions. Just look into the chat box. Yeah, I was yeah. just typing <laughs> throughout. Okay, and that's okay. what I like every time. There is such an amazing audience with wonderful questions. I've had always, you know, wonderful time answering and interacting, even yes. though virtual. Yes. But it's yes. amazing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a safe night. Yeah. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye-bye. you all for joining. Uh, this is the end of the first evening. And uh, we will start tomorrow sharp at 5.30 p.m. Tomorrow there are four sessions. Start by 5.30 and uh, four sessions will be there. Okay. Right. Okay, thank thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Vidhi. Hello, sir. Yeah, today, Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yes. yeah. You are audible. I was just uh, checking my audio. Today, this is the sec- first one. Second one, no? Ah, uh, second one. Second one. It's at 6.30, right? Ah, okay, sir. It is the second one. Initially, it was the third one. Second one is... Um, Madam is not coming? Yeah, second one is actually um, uh, 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 Radhika Madam stop. Hindu, Hindu is the uh, Hindu is moderating, and uh, Radhika Madam is okay. No, she's well. She's okay. She's okay. she's okay. I think so, Preeti. Uh, so um, I think um, Kedar stop will be the third one, and it is at seven thirty. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Start by seven thirty. It will be. It will be there. Everything went well today. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit. Uh, actually, with uh, some. No, ma- minutes, sir, uh, sir, we are on time. Yeah, we are so, actually within time. Everybody finished on time. Actually, all the questions also. Also went. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they are all professional speakers. That is why. Oh, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so see you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Good night. Bye. Uh, Nikhil, we can end the session for today.